Hello. Let me get to YouTube. How's everybody doing? How are you uh, doing on this day after Easter? I've been running all over. All over. I just got home about, I don't know, an hour ago, I think. An hour ago. And uh, literally, <laughs> I was starving. But I didn't want to get fast food, right? I don't... So um, I went shopping, and of course you grocery shopping on when you're hungry, right? You're, 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 the whole store is coming home with you. But um, I did that, came home, got changed, took a little shower, and um, came down, got myself something. I brought salad and peppers, and I had to bring my daughter to the the bus to go back to New York City. I had to drop Luke off. We rendezvoused with um, a friend of his mother. So we met in uh, the supermarket and uh, she had to do some shopping too. So did I. And then she took Luke home and they're having a little, uh, a few or two, three, I don't know how many boys she has over three boys besides her own four boys <laughs> so what's one more what's two more what's three more what's five more anyway it's it, it's just yucky and overcast here it is now it's going down now it's 38 degrees i know that um not, not tomorrow but wednesday i have to go for an ultrasound um but i think somebody said thursday it was going to snow I don't even want to go there. I don't even want to go there. Come on. Stop it. I made myself a cup of coffee. And I spoke to Evie earlier. And she was telling me, Oh, when are you going to get home? You've got to go and get into that police report. She's like, When you were saying you were going to stop last night, I was, No, no, no. But you read 100 pages. You know, it's an 11... 1162, well, 1162 page police report. I have never seen, I mean, we talk about discovery sometimes being 2,000 pages, right? Discovery being 1,500 pages. This is a police report. Do you understand that? This is not discovery. This is a police report. It will be in the part of the discovery, but this hasn't even gone to trial they don't even have charges on like all the charges on people yet okay so you have to understand this is just a police report this is like crazy and i feel so bad for um preston lord's family and i just hope that you know he gets the justice that he deserves because this was just a horrific horrific crime what they did here and how they um, just brutal, 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 brutal stuff. So we're going to continue reading on that. Let me go to the live chat so I can see you guys. <coughs> Gosh, I'm just joking on my coffee here. Okay. Let me see here. Here is my life. This is my life. An hour ago. And, uh, oh, sorry. I am. Hi, Linda. Hi, cute kitty kitty. How are you? <clears throat> yes, I hope you had a nice Easter as well. Hello, Sassy Dorsey. Hi, Dina. Uh-oh, I'm not in live chat. Everybody make sure you're in live chat. That'll really help out. So, Dina, I know you're not far from this whole tragedy right so let me get our police report up here I remember we on page 100 page 100 let's see here is that my police report yes Okay. 
So let me pull, let me get to page 100. And then I'll pull this over and we'll continue on with this. Hmm. 125. Okay. All right. Let me pull this over. Which tab of the 97? There we go. Okay, let me make this nice and large for you guys. Uh-oh, a little too large, right? And we were on page 100. Okay. So let me get this, here we are. Let me make sure I have my live chat up so I can make sure everything is good with sound and everything. Hi, Sharon. <coughs> so this is still the same officer, Megan Orskow. And this starts off on 11-29-2023 at approximately 12-39 hours. Detective D. Iribi and I interviewed Redacted. The interview was held in a private room at Desert Ridge High School and was recorded by my body-worn camera. The following is a summary of our interview and not verbatim. Is the sound okay? Sound okay? Okay. Redacted started the night at his friend's, Devin's house. Devin dressed up like the military and he dressed up as a prisoner. They got an Uber to the party house. They arrived at the house around 2100 to 2130 hours. When they, got, when they get to the party, they meet up with their friend, his name's Redacted, who was also dressed up as a prisoner and Redacted, unknown what she was wearing. They hung out at the party for a bit before everyone was kicked out. Initially... He and Devin did not have a ride, so they hung out in front of the party house. And then Devin's little brother, unknown name or what he was dressed as, was at the party and drove his gray Tacoma. He and Devin got a ride with Devin's little brother. Redacted stated Devin's little brother was parked on South 193rd Street. They had walked westbound east Via del Oro and then northbound on South 193rd Road to get to Devin's little brother's vehicle. Redacted stated he never saw any kind of altercation and never walked any further north on South 194th Street than the party house. While at the party, he did see Mason, Justin, Tristan Billy, Jake Meisner, and others who are known to hang out in that group in the backyard of the house. Redacted stated that there was about 15 of them together, but, then, but that they were just hanging out with themselves in a corner. Redacted only recalled seeing them in the backyard and never again that night. Hi, Linda Uribe. How are you, honey? Hi, Jeanette. Everyone, we talked about the boy missing in France. Remember the toddler? They found him. Oh, no. Really? That's very sad. Jeanette, prayers for the family. How sad. Okay. Backyard and never again that night. When asked if he had a photograph of that night to show what they were wearing, Redacted showed a photograph of two names there, Devin and himself, from a different night, but, started, but stated the outfit he was wearing was the same outfit from the party night. I asked Redacted if Redacted was at the party, and Redacted name said he was not there. Name of the calm witness. The photograph was uploaded to Axon, Axon Evidence. When asked if he saw or had any videos from that night, the witness stated that he was in 
group chat called Social Studies, and Taylor Sherman sent a video of redacted person getting dragged, a video already obtained by police. He stated that Taylor sent him the video in the moment as it was happening. The witness stated he did not know if there was further talk or videos because he didn't check the Snapchat messages and then the next day everything was deleted and people were leaving the group. When asked what he heard about the assault, the witness stated that he had messaged Jake Meisner on Snapchat asking him what had happened and Jake Meisner told him that Talon Renner was the one who punched him, meaning redacted. The witness stated the messages were no longer available as they delete automatically. The witness then mentioned that about two weeks ago, he was at a small get together and Mason Justin was there and so was a redacted person. Mason Justin confronted the redacted person for snitching on him. And then Mason told a redacted person that he had killed someone and that he redacted did not want to be the next one. The witness then provided the following information. Devin goes to Hamilton High School and Snapchat username was well, there. It's redacted. Goes to Hamilton High and Snapchat username goes to Perry High School and the next person goes to ICANN School and has a Snapchat username of redacted there. The witness did not have any con other contact information for the above names and this ended our contact. Okay. Okay. What's the matter? Okay. So next up. Now this person writing this is Dana Uribe. Third detective supplement. On December 6th, 2023, I assisted with completing a hand search of Gage Garrison's cell phone per a written consent to examine the date on the phone. This is a summary of what I lo located on Gage's cell phone that was pertinent to the investigation. Text message with redacted person on 10 2023 1926 hours conversation about Gage saying he was not going around any of them and discussed the GoFundMe for a redacted person with Gage stating he donated a text message thread with redacted and redacted that have large breaks after the date of the incident, possibly erase text messages, an email from Tanner Renner, possibly erased conversations. Text message threads with Mason Justin and Taylor Sherman also appears that messages were deleted due to the break in conversation. A call log was deleted prior to 10-30-2023. No relevant information on Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok. Photograph of William Hines, Gage, and two redacted people, Tristan Billy, again, two more redacted individuals, and other unknown males. Known members identified in the Gilbert Goons in 2023. Call detail records data received. AT&T account for Mason Justin. AT&T mobility account for William Hines. End of report 12-6-2023. Okay, this is again is by Megan Worsko. On December 4th, 2023, at approximately 1,600 hours, I responded to a residence located at an undisclosed address in Queen Creek for a scheduled interview with a redacted person along with his lawyer, Timothy Nelson, and mother, Desiree. 
Eirig. Present. Detective Shipman assisted in the interview. The interview was audio recorded and uploaded to Axon Ever Evidence. The following is a summary of the interview and not verbatim. The first several minutes of the interview, the redacted person discussed what he did on Friday, October 27th. After providing details on the day of October 27th, we asked him to tell us about his day on Saturday, October 28th. The witness, we're just going to call him the witness, okay, advised that he had gone over to Redacted's house about 15 or 1600 hours. He had driven his BMW over there and was by himself. When he arrived at the house, he remembered Mason. Redacted person, Treston and Jake all being over there and possibly another redacted name and another redacted name also being there. Then they all went to a Goodwill to get costumes and redacted recalled meeting another redacted person at the Goodwill. They also had gone to the dollar store and then they went back to the redacted person's house prior to leaving that redacted person's house to go to the various parties they hung out with four girls at the redacted person's house Caroline and three others that are all names redacted then they all went to the first party which was near a redacted residence in Queens Creek redacted name rode in a redacted person's large white SUV he believed they got to the first party around 20 30 or 2100 hours the redacted person described the party to be large with over 100 people present in the back of a large yard with a DJ. There was alcohol there, but nothing provided. The witness believed that they were there for approximately 30 minutes. He did not recall seeing any kind of altercation and described the atmosphere to be relaxed. He recalled the following people being at, his par at this party and provided the vehicle that they arrived in. Mason, his Frontier, a redacted person, his SUV, a redacted person, possibly Mason's Frontier, but was unsure, and another redacted person, and a redacted person in a vehicle. Taylor Sherman with an unknown vehicle, another person with her small SUV, Jake Meisner, unknown vehicle, the witness could not remember if Caroline or the other three girls had gone to the first party or not. He did mention that he knew for sure that they had not gone to the second party. After the first party, they went to the second party of the night. The witness stated he believed that they got to the second party around 2100 hours. He described the second party to be at a house that had a large garage that had a side door that led to the backyard. The party was only within the garage and the backyard and not in the main part of the house. There were over a hundred people present and people were drinking but he did not recall seeing alcohol being provided. The same people from the first party except the four girls also went to the second party. The witness remained in redacted person's vehicle throughout the night. Hi Jen Grill. When they got to the second party, he and a redacted person broke off from the rest of the group. They were doing their own thing and talking to girls in the backyard of the house. The witness did not recall seeing any altercation occur in the backyard. As they, himself and another person, and possibly another person, were doing their own thing, he noticed that a large group of people were leaving, including his friends. He did not know if it was because people were getting kicked out or people were just leaving. He and a redacted person followed behind the large crowd. The crowd left the house and while on the street they started to advance forward quickly. The witness saw several people running so he started to run. He and a redacted individual's person's name here 
had gotten separated in the midst of running. And he was running. As he was running, he noticed a large group of people that he described to be the look of a schoolyard fight. There was a break in between the group where he saw what could have been a person on the group. The witness described the area to be dark with little lighting and he could not recall seeing anyone specific near the person on the ground. When he saw the schoolyard fight to look, he continued running and went back to some person's vehicle. He left the party with another person and Treston and possibly another person in someone's vehicle. The witness advised that he knew someone was in the vehicle with them at one point but could not recall after what party that person had gotten into the car with them. Okay, I didn't know. I provided a map of the second party and asked the witness to walk me through the chain of events on the map. The witness was unable to provide details related to the map. Hmm, could that be because you're not telling the truth? Possibly, right? I mean, it back, I paint it black. They then went to two more parties after the second party. At one of the last two parties, they met up with two more people. They also had picked up Caroline, another person, an unknown female, and an unknown male at one point and ended the night at someone else's house. The witness stated the girls and the unknown male did not spend much time at the house I imagine before leaving. The witness stayed the night and slept on the couch. He remembered Mason, Jake, Treston, another person, Gage, and possibly Taylor Sherman and Talon Renner at Imagine that says the house at the end of the night. The witness stated he recalled seeing Talon at one point in the night, but did not know when. He advised that he did not know Talon well enough to talk to him. When asked what was discussed about the incident, the witness stated he had heard that there were several altercations that night, but that a redacted person's name did not think anything about it because it's not uncommon for fights to happen at parties. The witness could not remember what was specifically said about the fights and who said what. The witness provided the following descriptions for the following individuals. Himself, a black suit with a red tie from Spirit and a snap back hat. Mason, wore a black suit from the Halloween Spirit store. Redacted name, wore a white suit with a black undershirt. Another redacted name wore a black suit with a pocket square, possibly a pocket square gray in color. Another person wore a black or gray suit with possibly a gray tie. Another one a brown suit with a fedora. Gage wore a black suit. Treston, a white suit with red and a fedora. Taylor was in a black suit. Someone was in something unknown. Jake Meisner was wearing a purple suit and a hat with a feather. And then someone else was wearing an older style gray suit. And then another one was wearing a DC steakhouse uniform, which is a professional look. It should be noted that throughout the entirety of the interview, the witness would provide information, but then follow up with either he was not positive or he could be wrong. When it came to details about the night of the incident, our interview ended with the witness discussing irrelevant information. Okay. This supplement is being generated to show my involvement in this case, on this case. On November 8th, 2023, I contacted or attempted to contact the following residences to obtain video surveillance from the night of 10-28-2023. I spoke with Dave Monk, who stated that they did not have any cameras. I spoke with Terry 
and obtained a ring camera footage and uploaded to Axon evidence. Cameras were visible, however, I was unable to get a hold of the residents. Cameras do not capture any street views. I spoke with Lee Weather, who advised there were no cameras. Reviewed video footage and no camera views on the streets. Footage obtained and uploaded to Axon Evidence. Spoke with Kenneth Calton about the over the phone, who advised he only had two clips from 10 28 23. Those clips were uploaded to Axon Evidence. I spoke with Diana Wright, who advised they had no cameras. I spoke with Chad Camp, who uploaded 121 clips of the request time frame to Axon Evidence. I reviewed every clip of video surveillance submitted, submitted and obtained. Most clips did not provide any relevant information. However, there were two clips obtained from the residents of Redacted Person that were of interest. The first clip is from the time frame 22 to 23 to 22 6, 28 hours. The clip is labeled VEH Meetup, Redacted Surveillance in Axon Evidence. The following is what I observed in the clip. In the beginning of the clip, several vehicles were seen driving on the street of East Via del Palo. At approximately 22.04.03 hours, a smaller black SUV is seen driving eastbound on East Via del Paolo. And then, hey Judy, thank you for becoming a Deputy Rambler. We appreciate that very much. And then southbound on South 195th Street before stopping in the middle of the Street, another sports style two door, possibly silver in color passenger vehicle is seen following the black SUV and parked next to the SUV in the middle of the street. The vehicles remain there from approximately 220412 into 220543, and they both turn around and drive back westbound on East Via del Palo. The second clip is from the time frame 213847 to 212901 hours. The clip is labeled running, and it's redacted, surveillance in axon evidence. The following is what I observed in the clip. In this clip, I observed a male figure wearing a reflective vest. He was walking eastbound on East Via del Paolo. He looks behind him and then starts to run before leaving the camera. Camera view. These clips have been shared with lead detective Jay Iribi. On 11-2-2023, I reviewed the following tips that were sent to the email address of, and then gives an email address. All tips have been saved as PDF files and uploaded to Axon Evidence. Below is a description of the tip. If it is new information that detectives have not been made aware of, all tips have been assigned a tip number. They coincide with the Excel sheet with all the tip information. I responded back to all the tips received mentioned below on 12-19-2023, thanking them for the information and advising them if they had any additional information to contact QCPD. Hear that? Contact QCPD. All right. Tip 53 received on 1030 from redacted person. New info. Instagram account had a short clip of a boy punching two other boys. Instagram handle is, and of course it's redacted. 11 2 2023. Check the Insta account and it's no longer available. Tip 54, received on 10-30-2023. New info, be aware of a child with the name of redacted. Photograph attached appears to be secondhand information. Tip 55, received on October 30th. 
2023 from information already obtained by the police. Tip 57 was received the same day from irrelevant videos. Another tip, same day, 10-30-2023, from information for different party. Then another one, um, information already obtained by police. And tip 60 is the same thing. Tip 3, received 10 31 2023 from redacted new information that attends evite i think it's evite in the am for aviation at the power road campus he has been allegedly been shown students a video been showing students a video of the incident he received from friends that was involved that were involved the video shows this kid getting punched to the ground and then stomped on by others. Refer to Detective Blount's follow-up. Tip 61 received on 10 2023 from information already obtained by the PD. Same thing for 62. Tip 4 received on 10-31 from a redacted person. It says... Um, New information supposedly has video footage. I believe he may be a student at Castile High School. Refer to Detective Blount's follow-up. Tip 63. Received on 10-31-23 from um, redacted person. Information already obtained by PD. Tip 64. Received on 10-31-2023 from a redacted person. Irrelevant information. Okay. On 11 4 2023, I followed, I reviewed the following tips that were sent to an email address. All tips have been saved as PDF files and will, and will be attached to the report. Below is a description of a tip. If it is new information, the detectives have not been made aware. All tips have been assigned to a tip number that coincides with the Excel sheet with all of the... What are you scaring me? What are you doing? What's that? Why do you have to go to the hospital? That's fine. What, what do you mean? Oh my gosh, sorry guys. He's messing with me. Oh, is that April Fool's? Okay. Um, sorry. All right. Now, <laughs> give me a heart attack. I reviewed the following and tips that were sent to the email address. All tips have been saved as PDF files will be attached to this report. Below is a description of the tip. If it's new information that detectives have not been made aware of, all tips have been assigned to a tip number that coincides with the Excel sheet with all the tip information. I responded back to all the tips received mentioned below on 12-19-2023, thanking them for their information and advising them if they had any additional information to contact QCPD. 1. Tip 5. Received on 10-30-2023 from a redacted person. New info. Possibly witness senior at perry high school is the witness won't cooperate with parents parents recommend taking her phone as there might be videos then a person was successfully contacted and interviewed tip 65 received on 10 30 10 30 2023 from a redacted person and it's already obtained information tip 66 received on 10 30 from irrelevant. Tip 67 is also irrelevant, so is 68. And 69 was received on 10 31, 2023, from Instagram of Halloween Party. Unrelated people involved, unsure what Halloween Party. Tip 6 received on 10 31 from a redacted person. Jacob Pennington possibly involved because he likes to fight people. He drives a white Toyota Camry Sport. 
No other suggestion that Pennington is involved refer to Detective Blount's follow-up. Tip 70 received on 10-31-2023 from information already obtained. Again, for tip 71, same thing. Tip 7 received 10-31-2023 from all of party information referred to Detective Blount's follow-up. Tip 72 received on 10-31 from redacted pics of a TikTok video of a party. Tip 73 received from a redacted person. That's information already obtained. Okay, so we're going to just skip down because right down to 79 is the same thing. It's just information already obtained. And then 80, 9, 81, 82 is information pertaining to Alla Party. Tip 83 uh, was already obtained, already obtained. Tip 8, new info, uh, somebody at Combs High School, possible witness, refer to Detective Blount's follow-up. 25 already obtained. Um, that's tip 85, 86, 87 already obtained. 88 was information already obtained. 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94 was background on Gilbert Gunny's believed reason for the attack on a redacted person was over a video redacted had. Tip 95 was information already obtained, so was tip 96. And on 11.1, there was information, a new Dropbox link full of screenshots, possible eyewitness information, refer to Detective Blount's follow-up. Okay, already received information for 97, 98, that was information on Gilbert Goons and previous case involving them. 99, information already obtained. 100, information already obtained. 101, already obtained. And then tip 10, address of possible suspect. Refer to Detective Blount's follow-up. Tip 102, received on 11-1 from information already obtained by the police. Again, 103 is the same, 104, and then 11, received on 11-1, 2023, from screenshots of possible eyewitnesses, refer to Detective Blount's follow-up. Okay, the, those right there, the rest, are all obtained prior. So is this, and down to tip 12, received 11-2 from an unknown party. Uh, unknown, what party, brother of... Someone from Castile High School, part of a fight, refer to Detective Blount's follow-up. Then tip 112 was already obtained, so was 113, so was 114, so was 115. Then we're down to tip 13, received on 11-3 from, it's my father's birthday, new information about the Renner family and how Talon had attacked another person. Officer Brady made contact with RP and completed a supplement with information referred to Detective Blount's follow-up. Tip 116 was something already obtained by the PD. Tip 14 was received on 11-3 from SRO from Campo Verde High School. A redacted person possibly involved several um, Queens Creek PD. Detectives have been in touch with SRP Pillar. This concluded in any involvement in addressing any tips. Okay, this is investigative help. On 12 20, 2023, I was tasked with calling the following individuals and their parents regarding scheduling walkthroughs of the scene. And they're all redacted. On 12 20, 2023, I spoke with Adam Graham. 
Redacted's father, a walkthrough of the scene was scheduled for 12-21-2023 at approximately 1,400 hours. On 12-20-2023, I spoke with Sandra Flores. Redacted's mother, Sandra declined allowing, I'm sure that's their child, to participate in a walkthrough and stated that she had already done her part with the investigation. On 12 20, 2023, I spoke with Carly Cartmel, Redacted's mother. A walkthrough was scheduled for 12 26, 2023 at approximately 1600 hours. Walkthroughs. Let's see what happens here. On 12 21, the following scene walkthroughs were completed by Detective D. Uribe and I. All the scene walkthroughs were recorded on my body-worn camera and uploaded to Axon Evidence. The following are summaries of what was said during the walkthroughs. They are not verbatim. The first walkthrough was with a redacted name of a witness. Please refer to Detective D. Aribi supplement for details. The second walkthrough was with redacted Redacted was accompanied by his parents. The walkthrough stated, uh, excuse me, started on the corner of East Via del Ora and South 194th Street, pointed at the address of Redacted in Queens Creek at the, as the house where the party was being held. He had gotten a ride with someone along, the, along with other people. They had all rode in the truck to the party. They had parked the truck on East Via del Rancho in front of the residence of that person. Once they had parked the truck, they all walked up to the garage area of the party house. They did not know anyone there and were hanging around the garage area. They then went into the backyard of the house where they had seen a friend from elementary. They were talking with this person when an unknown black male with dreads wearing a beanie had approached someone and started yelling at someone. The unknown black male wanted to fight that person. Someone started to record the interaction between that person and the unknown black male when another unknown male told that person to stop recording because they did not want to get in trouble. The person described the second unknown male as a short, heavy set Hispanic male wearing a costume. The person showed the video that the person had taken and pointed out the male in a white suit as the subject who confronted the person about recording this video. And this video had already been obtained by the police and is on Axon Evidence labeled as Movie 3072. The video of verbal with something redacted, redacted and his friends convinced someone whose name is redacted to delete the video. Meanwhile, the person had left during the conversation of the video being deleted. After the person deleted the video, that person and his group of friends exited the backyard of the house through a small gate on the east side of the residence, just south south of the larger gate. The person started there stated, excuse me, stated there was no physical altercation at this point. As they left the residence, they started to walk northbound on South 194th Street back towards someone's truck. Someone and his friends had noticed that a large group of people, the same people who confronted the person about the video, were following them. The person was in front of his friend group and the people following them. As the person approached the mailbox, 
that was uh, placed south 194th Street and was turning the corner to go eastbound on East Via Del Rancho, someone heard some commotion and someone say, he got hit. Someone looked behind him and saw a person holding his ear as if he had just got punched. The large number of people who were following them started to put their hands up in a fight-like manner. At this point, someone started running and ran eastbound on East Via Del Rancho. He ran with someone and someone else. As he was running, he recalled seeing someone near someone else and saw him hit the ground. The witness was unsure if he fell or he was pushed and could not recall if anyone else was around. They continued to run and ended up jumping the fence of the residence of Redacted and ended up on the east side of the residence. Redacted was with a redacted person and another redacted person while running and the witness believed that they had run about a half a mile eastbound before stopping and hiding in a bush. And then they received a call from someone who was alone. They sent that person their pin location and they, uh, redacted person had met back up with them. Two redacted people who were not at the party in a small f white four passenger vehicle. Once they were picked up, they had made their way back to South Redacted Address. At this point, police were already on scene and the scene was taped off with caution and tape. At some point prior to Redacted getting back to the scene, he received a call from a redacted person that was hysterical, begging someone to call the police, stating that someone had hurt his arm and someone else was asleep on the floor not waking up and people were performing cpr on him the person kept telling someone to get here and that he needed him the person said it was difficult to understand the person then explained that they did not go to the truck when they were being followed because they did not want them to know what vehicle they drove. Before ending the walkthrough, um, the man was asked to tell where... Hold on a minute. I'm trying to hear something. Okay. Before ending the walkthrough, I was asked to tell everyone it's prior to running. Please refer to my BWC video on Axon evidence labeled as walkthrough for a visual representation. The last redacted thing that had seen redacted was right when they all started to run eastbound on East Via Del Rancho. They confirmed he never saw any physical altercation that night, but they heard a lot of commotion prior to running. When asked if he had recognized anyone specifically that was a part of the group following him and his friends, he stated that he can only recall the Hispanic male in the white suit as being a part of the verbal altercation in the backyard with the person. And then he was a part of the group following them outside of the party the person described the Hispanic male as being the primary aggressor and the one that led the group. This concluded the walkthrough with that redacted person. Hi, Christine. Hi, Margo. Okay. The third walkthrough was with someone else who was accompanied by their parents. The walkthrough started on the corner of East via del oro and south 194th street the person stated he arrived at the party with his friends all their names are redacted and some others that he did not recall the witness pointed out the address of which was redacted in queen creek as the house where the party was being held and stated that they had parked the person's truck over there while pointing northbound on south 194th street the witness stated that when they first arrived they had just walked up to the house when the cops had come by and flashed their lights everyone started to run but the cops 
did not, did not do anything. So he and his friends went back to the party. They walked to the backyard and observed a huddle of people who were two taller, jacked, black males appeared that they were about to fight. One of the black males was wearing an all-black suit, and the witness could not recall what the other black male was wearing. The witness and his friends were behind the huddle of people just watching when a short Hispanic male wearing gray joggers started to record the black males arguing. The person did not know the subject recording the argument, but recalled walking into the party with him and stated that he was possibly a friend of a friend's. Another tiny Mexican dude wearing a white suit with a red tie approached the Hispanic male in joggers, deleted the video, and the other tiny Mexican dude continued to yell at him. At this point, the Hispanic male in joggers started to leave the party along with along with two others and his friends followed behind him and left the party. The Hispanic male in joggers, someone else and the rest of someone's friends were walking out of the garage into the driveway towards South 194th Street when someone noticed a lot of people were following them. His friends got to the mailbox of the residence when he started to walk northbound on South 194th Street behind everyone else. As he was walking northbound, he heard someone say, We got one of them! And then saw someone running southbound across the yard of someone. And southbound on South 194th Street. Someone in, someone told someone else to start running, and they started running and started to walk back northbound on South 194th Street towards East Via Del Rancho. The person had continued to run southbound as he was walking towards East Via Del Rancho. He observed about 10 to 15 people in the area where he would eventually find a redacted person. The witness could not provide details on the subjects as, is, as it was dark. The witness continued to walk when he stopped and talked to an unknown subject who told him that some kid looks dead on the ground over there. Someone described the unknown kid as a skinny white male with brown hair wearing a red shirt and possibly a hat. They walked over to where they had last seen his friends. The witness walked over running and where the known subject told him that a kid was on the ground. As he turned the corner to go eastbound on East Via Del Rancho from South 194th Street, he observed leaning up against the front left tire of a parked white car that was there facing eastbound. At this point, the person was breathing and redacted And other unknown people picked, redacted up, and brought him to the pathway of redacted, described the redacted person to be blue and purple in color and had blood coming out of his nose, spit coming out of his mouth. Meanwhile, someone was at their truck, and that was parked directly across from where he was recovering himself. Okay. Across from where he was receiving CPR. So, I don't know why I just said, I, I, where the heck did I just read that? So, someone went up to the two people who was on the phone with the police, and they came running westbound on East Via Del Rancho towards him. And the witness stating that he had broken his arm, then they waited together on the scene until the police showed up. The witness stated that he recalled two or three people walking up to the white car that was that the person was leaned up against, and then they left the scene. They could not describe who walked to the white car. The witness then showed a photograph of a Hispanic male in a white suit. 
identified by police as Trustin Billy, as the subject who told his friends to stop recruiting while in the backyard and also stated that he was part of the group following his friends, then showed a screenshot and a video of a verbal with someone and stated that there were males in the verbal argument. Someone stated he did not recall seeing the black males as walking out and following his friends. This concluded the walkthrough with this person. On 12-26-2023, Detective D. Eribe and I conducted a scene walkthrough with another person and her mother, Carly Carl Cartmel. The scene walkthrough was recorded on uh, Detective Eribe's body-worn camera and uploaded to Axon Evidence. Okay, let's see here. Excellent. The following is a summary of what was said during the walkthrough and not verbatim. The walkthrough started on the corner of East Via del Oro on South 194th Street. We then walked northbound on South 194th Street where someone pointed out the address of something in Queens Creek is the house where the party was being held. She had arrived with South with Talon Vigil, Talon Vigil and someone else in a white Camry and they had parked their vehicle facing 194th Street. They got out of the vehicle and started walking northbound on South 194th Street towards the driveway of redacted person. When they got in front of the driveway, they waited there for someone and TK and Mason Jostin. So four people, and then they all walked into the backyard of that house. While in the backyard, everyone was socializing when a large group started to form, and there was yelling and arguing among the boys. Just trying to start fights, stated the boys um, could, not prov could not provide specifics on what was being said or what the boys were arguing about. When asked if there was anyone in that group that stood out as the primary aggressor, the witness stated Mason Justin. The witness said Mason Justin was primarily talking to Edgars like Mexicans. She stated that the Mexicans were not in costumes and they were wearing primarily all black. The witness stated the males she was with at the party started talking about taking it outside and yelling, go outside, P-U-S-S-Y. Then they all walked out towards the driveway of the residence. The witness said she and someone else followed behind the large group. The witness stated that she and an unknown person had known what was going on to was going to happen because the boys she hangs out with are known to start fights at parties and with the arguing started in the backyard and then being told to bring it outside indicated to her that a fight was going to take place she and the witness remained behind in the large group as the group walked northbound on south 194th street she and the witness remained in front of the driveway of residents while the large group continued north on South 194th Street and ended up east on East Via Del Rancho. Stated that there were several cars parked and people walking around that blocked her view. Okay, let's see. I'm just waiting on something here before I get another interruption. The witness then stated prior to the assault occurring, she had talked to someone who had asked her for her number and then stated that his friends were a part of the argument, but that they had not done anything. The witness said the conversation between her and the person was short 
and after he asked for her number, their conversation was ended. The witness stated that she knew it was prior to the assault because the large group of boys was still in the middle of the road on South 194th Street, and there was yelling going on. And later she learned that, later the witness learned that there was talking about being a part of someone's friend group because they had texted each other and the person told her that his friends ended up in the hospital. After her conversation with that person, she and another person walked back towards the Camry. As they got close to the Camry, she saw Talon Vigil running towards the car from the corner of South 194th Street and East Via Del Rancho. She had identified the subject running towards as Vigil because she had described recognized what Talon was wearing and it was black jeans, Jordans, and Ryan Denny merch shirt and a hat. Talon Vigil was running alone. Once Talon Vigil had gotten to the Camry, they got in and Talon stated that I just knocked out a kid cold. We have to go. We have to leave. Talon turned the vehicle around which was originally facing southbound on South 194th Street and drove northbound on South 194th Street towards East Via Del Rancho. They stopped in the middle of the road on South 194th Street, just south of East Via Del Rancho, due to a large amount of people in the road. They could not take... Uh, provide an explanation on why they went northbound on South 194th Street to leave instead of taking the easiest way out, which would have been westbound on East Via Del Oro. When asked if anyone had gotten out of the vehicle while it was parked in the middle of the road, the witness had initially stated that no one had gotten out, but that then stated that Talon had gotten out and walked in front of the car but stayed in the roadway. The person, the witness could not provide details on what he was doing or who he was with and said he was outside of the car for about four to five minutes. When asked if she saw or heard another fight occurring, she denied any acknowledgement of another fight. Once Talon got back into the vehicle, they had left and there was no mention of the fight or the incident. The witness did say that Talon appeared to be freaking out and looked really nervous and kept looking around and was breathing heavily. After the incident occurred and social media had blown up, Talon told the witness that he never hit that person but that he had hit a black kid. The witness then stated that she has only talked to a couple of the boys from that group but that the incident had not been brought up. The witness confirmed that prior to the incident and social media going around, she did not know something and did not recall seeing him the night of the incident. That ended the contact with um, the person and Carly, the mother. Okay, so there we've got that. Let's go here. Carly Cartmel Gilbert Goon's information. On 11-18-2023, I received a text message from Carly Cartmel using the phone number redacted with the following message. Hi, Detective Warskow. I'm going to forward what I have, have on the Goons from previous run-ins. They have had smaller secret instas that have maybe 30-ish people on them. And they used to post everything they did on them. This is how I found out about them. I don't know what accounts someone gave you, but in case you don't have some or of their smaller accounts, I have several precious fights they orchestrated and posted. Attached to the text message were several screenshots or screen recordings, which have all been uploaded to Axon Evidence and are labeled Cartmel Goon's History. I reviewed the images and videos and was able to determine that they were not related to our investigation, but did show a history of some of the individuals that had been identified as part of this investigation. 
Okay, the following is a brief description of each photo or video provided. Okay, so these are going to say labeled as axon. Okay, I'm not going to go through that for each one. I'm just going to give the, the uh, name of it Cartmel Goons History Video 1, Cartmel Goons History Video 2, Cartmel Goons History Video 3, Cartmel Goons History Photograph 1, same thing, Photograph 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. On 12-28, I conducted a scene walkthrough with the witness and his mother, Maria Villa Villalba. The scene walkthrough was recorded on my body-worn camera and uploaded to Axon Evidence. The following is a summary of what was said during the walkthrough and not verbatim. The walkthrough started on the corner of East El Ora and South 194th Street. The witness pointed at the cul-de-sac at the top of East Via del Oro and stated that there was that the area that he and the redacted person ended up in at the end of the night. We then talked. We walked northbound on 194th Street. And when I asked him if anything looked familiar, he said no. I pointed at the house of so-and-so and so-and-so that he now recognized the house as the party house because of the gate and the large garage. The witness stated that he rode to the party with a kid who went to Coombs High School in a pickup truck. They stated he, That person stated that he did not know the driver of the vehicle, but he had known that person who knew the driver and was also with two other people and two other people they had met up with and had the rest of the boys at a smaller party before they had all gone into the pickup truck and arrived at the last party where the incident had occurred. The witness stated that when they first arrived, he got out of the truck and then he lost contact with everyone else in the truck as they had drove off because the police had shown up. However, they ended up parking and returning to the party where Redacted had met back up with them and did not know where they had parked the truck, but knew he had to meet up with them in front of the party house. They go into the garage where they're approached by two girls who ask them what school they go to. The group advised that they were from Coombs High School, according to one of them. Um, people do not like Combs High School kids, so the witness was unsure if that played a role in the incident later on. After talking to the girls, they go into the backyard where he observes two black males arguing. Started to record the argument when an Asian male, who was a not allowed him and just, okay, yeah. Uh, showed the Asian male his camera roll. Okay. They stated the Asian male still appeared to be upset and the friends left the party. They could not recall if they had been kicked out of the party or if they had just left on their own. As the witness and his friends walked out of the house and went northbound on South 194th Street, they noticed that a large group of males were following them. And the same Asian male from the backyard was a part of that group following them. The witness stated he believed the Asian male was leading the large group. The witness advised he was in the back of his friend group, but in front of the large group following them. As they're walking northbound on South 194th Street and are in between the driveways of two more redacted people and a redacted person, the Asian male has snatched up and watch, oh my gosh, and what you're going to do about it. Hold on a second, hold on. Had snatched the person's chain off his neck. The Asian male then held the chain up and asked, what you going to do about it? Another white male with longish hair wearing a black suit also asked 
the person what he was going to do about it. The person whose chain it was told him that it was fake and then continued walking northbound on South 194th Street. As the person turned around to go northbound, he felt a boom to the right side of his head and demonstrated a punch to the side of the face. After that person got hit, someone had yelled something, and then he and his friends all took off running in different directions. Okay. The person believes that the Asian male is the one that hit him because after that person got angry, he turned around facing the large group following them and saw the Asian male directly behind him to his right side while the rest of the group was behind the Asian male. The witness ran eastbound on East Via del Rancho with three people and was on the south side of the road with a person while another person was on the north side of the road. At one point, he saw someone on the ground while three to four people were around him and stomping on him. The, per the witness could not provide a description of the people assaulting the person on the floor as it was dark outside. The person continued to run. He and someone else ran through an open field where they ended up hiding behind a half wall at the address of Redacted. As they were sitting behind the half wall, they noticed people were driving around and circling the area, making them believe that males were looking for them. So he and the person jumped the fence and ended up in the backyard of Redacted. They remained there until... One of the um, witnesses got a phone call from someone saying that the police were here. They walked over to the person while someone remained at the house until his mother picked him up and then they left the area. The witness never saw the person get assaulted and did not know where the assault had occurred. He had last seen him when they were walking northbound on South 194th Street. The person believes that he could identify the Asian male, but stated that it would be too difficult to identify anyone else. They, this concluded my contact with, with the redacted person regarding the incident. Hi, Snow. I know you sent me an email, but I, I've been running around like a lunatic with my head cut off, and I didn't get a chance to reply yet. On 1-11-2024, I was asked to interview Dale Jorgensen regarding an assault that took place regarding the Gilbert Goons. I met with Dale Jorgensen and his mother, Rachel Jorgensen, at the Queen Creek Police Department. The interview was audio and video recorded, and it was uploaded to Axon. The following is a summary of, the summary of my interview with Dale and Rachel. It is not verbatim. The incident occurred 11-22-2022 at a house party located at, oh my gosh, um, the incident occurred on 11-22-2022 at a house party located at either someone or someone's in Queen Creek, Arizona. The party was hosted by, their names are redacted, a friend of Dale's. Dale stated the party was supposed to be a small invite-only party, however, a kid at the Basha High School had posted about the party on his Snapchat story and people started to show up. The people started to get out of hand, so Dale started to tell people they need to leave. You need to leave. Get out of here. You got too many people. Dale and his friend were in the front yard of the residence when Dale was telling people to leave. Dale remembered focusing his attention on three males asking them to leave. Dale stated... One male had ear length hair, black, and black hair, and was wearing blue jeans, a jacket, and a white undershirt. The second male had long black curly hair, and the third male had shaggy blonde hair and 
a middle part. The three males were part of a larger group, totaling about eight, ma eight males altogether. Dale stated they all looked very similar, all being white males with longer hair than longer than their ears. When Dale had told the three males to leave, they started asking him, what are you going to do about it? And they kept asking Dale if he knew this kid. Dale told them he did not know this kid. And told them to leave again. They concluded, they continued to yell at Dale, saying that he got, saying that, saying that he did know something, and Dale told them to shut the F up and just leave. And that's when he got physically attacked by a large group of males. Dale stated the male subject who was assaulting him was was SP1. SP1 had brass knuckles and just started swinging on Dale. All the other males were also throwing punches and kicking Dale, but Dale specifically remembers SP1 because of the brass knuckles. SP1 had hit him with the brass knuckles on the right hand and on the top of the head. Dale was able to break free from the fight and ran to the backyard of the house and the large group of males left the party. Dale stated while he was in the backyard right after the fight, people started telling him that the one with the brass knuckles was Tyler Freeman. Dale stated once he learned Tyler's name, he was able to positively identify Tyler Freeman as the suspect who had hit him with the brass knuckles. Dale stated that Mason Justin was also part of a large group who had assaulted him, but stated he did not believe Mason Justin had assaulted him. Dale stated he knew Mason prior to the assault, and that's how he identified Mason as being there. Dale advised that he did not recognize anyone else from the large group. Dale and Tyler Freeman were arrested for that assault. He had looked into Tyler Freeman and further confirmed that Tyler was about was the same male who had assaulted him. I then asked Dale about the kid. Dale stated he doesn't know but learned that they were talking about a kid named something else. Dale said he learned that the same group of kids had assaulted him and attempted to assault him earlier in the day. However, the person was not home when they went to jump him. So instead, the group robbed him by taking a bunch of his belongings from his house. Dale could not provide me with who told him about the robbery. Wow, right? Dale stated that a girl named Redacted posted his attack to her Snapchat story on the night it had happened. Dale does not know, but someone had sent him the video of the fight and Dale had saved it. I reviewed the video and observed the following. The video was posted by someone with the Snapchat name of Totally Redacted. The video had the caption 220. And then I observed a large group of young males physically assaulting one male who was identified as Dale. Dale was on the ground being attacked by several subjects when another male later identified as, it's redacted, wearing a gray baseball cap, a gray Nike sweater, and gray shorts started to punch one of the males, assaulting him. <coughs> Excuse me, assaulting Dale. The group started to back off of Dale besides one male. Dale remained on the ground when the male with ear length, black hair, a gray jacket, white shirt, gray pants, and black shoes punched Dale in the head with his right hand. The male is seen holding a shiny object in his right hand as he punched Dale in the head. Wow. 
horrible as he punched Dale in the head. Well, wow. okay. Dale got off the ground and he was getting up. The same subject kicked Dale in the face with his right foot. Wow. The subject was still holding a shiny object in his right hand. Pair of brass knuckles, can't mind you. Dale got up and lunged forward at another male who had big shoulders, length hair, and was wearing, um, oh gosh, I know that, I know the one you're talking about, that, that, that one is, um, oh my gosh. So, black hoodie, black red chucked pants, and white shoes. The crowd of boys all started to attack Dale again and then go into the video ends. And then the video ends. Dale explained that the caption 2 to 0 was referring to redacted robbery and then his assault. Lucas Brutsch was a friend of Dale's who was trying to help him. You can witness the fight, but Dale is unsure where he was. Hold on a minute. Everything was happening. Dale provided Lucas's number, Lucas's number, and Jordan's number. Dale sh also showed photographs of the injury to his head which appeared to be an inch long laceration to the side photographs of those injuries. Both the video and photograph of his head have been uploaded to Axon information. When asked if Dale had received any packages for his injuries, they all started that he, he must, he must, hold on a minute. happened to Jordan's number that he did not have any photographs of those injuries but the video and the photograph of his head had been uploaded to Axon evidence when asked if Dale had received any medical attention for his injuries they stated that he did not and just used liquid bandage I then asked Dale if at the time of his incident was the Gilbert Goons a known group Dale stated that it was not but that People were becoming aware of a group of kids harassing just Arizona. He advised that Gilbert Goons did not become known until months after his incident. When asked if they had reported the incident when it occurred, both Dale and Rachel advised that they did not report it to law enforcement. They had learned that the kids involved were Perry High School students, so Rachel reached out to the school to inform them of the incident, but she had not reopened it any further. They did not report to law enforcement until the case came about. At about that point, they had called the FBI, who had called Te uh, Heather. Um, Heather, what the hell? Gilbert. I, oh my gosh, I, I'm falling asleep a little bit here, so I don't know what is going on here. Let me go back here. They did not report it to law enforcement until the blank case came about. At that point, they had called the FBI, who told them to report it to the Gilbert police. They reported the incident to the Gilbert police about a week ago. From this interview, they were given an incident number of G blah, 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 blah. And then they wanted to report it to Queen Creek Police for information purposes. I have to, let me just grab some coffee here because I, what's happening is I'm falling asleep and I don't know what the hell is happening. It, it's like, I'm not that tired, but then I start reading and imagine when you're reading and you're tired, then I'm like, here I'm, I'm just like, well, it, it's getting to be like, uh, remember the uh, Seaver case? Or that case where, what did we just do like a couple weeks ago? And I said uh, something that is totally not in there. Something about dogs or something. being It was just something crazy. 
What the heck? Let me try to wake up for a minute. I've just got to stop reading for one minute so I can try to wake up so I'm not falling asleep. I'm literally like falling asleep. And I want to read this. I really do. But I have coffee here and I should drink some more of it. This has ruined a lot of families. Yes, it has. Snow remover. Whew. I just have to wake up a minute. Okay, let's see. On 118 2024, I responded to the address located at blank Arizona to conduct a follow up on a tip advised that the redacted brother had either seen or had a video of the assault involving redacted. The interviews were recorded on my body worn camera and uploaded to Axon Evidence. Detective Klingen Smith also attended the interviews along with both Redacted's brother's parents, Tara and Stephen Sprague. Before interviewing Redacted and Redacted, we spoke with Tara and Stephen about the incident and about the tip received. Then we interviewed both witnesses separately with their parents present. All parties interviewed were positively identified by the Arizona driver's license, except for a person who identified himself as a redacted name and his parents confirmed his identity. The following is a summary of our conversations. It is not verbatim. Both Tara and Stephen expressed to us that since this incident with Redacted had occurred, they've had multiple discussions with their boys regarding the seriousness of the incident and asked if they had any knowledge of this event, which both boys advised they did not. They confirmed that the boys were not at the redacted party, and we're at a smaller invite-only party. They also advised that they do routine checks on their boys' phones even before this incident, and they didn't come across anything regarding the incident. They also confirmed going through a hidden or password-protective apps or files to include the My Eyes Only folder in Snapchat. We asked them if either of the boys would have to say these other boys were known to say, I, hold on a minute, let me see this. We asked them if either of their boys were known to say something to gain attention and explain that they could have possibly stated that they had seen something they hadn't for attention. And both parents advised that they don't believe either of their boys would try to gain attention in that manner. They also confirmed going through hidden or password protected apps or files to include the My Eyes Only folder in Snapchat. Okay. <clears throat> the witness advised that he did not attend the party where the person was assaulted and was at a smaller party that evening. He advised that he does not have any knowledge on what occurred that night and everything he does know about the incident has been from the media. The witness denied ever seeing or processing a video pertaining to that person's assault. And they also stated that they don't know why someone would say that he had a video or had seen a video and denied ever taking a video involving the redacted person. Trevor had no further information. Okay. The witness advised that he did not attend the party. Okay, this is the same thing. Oh, this is the other brother, I guess. Where the person was assaulted. He was at a smaller party with some friends. Denied ever seeing or possessing a video. 
also stated that he does not know why someone would say that he has a video if he doesn't. And he further advised that he has not talked about the incident with his friends or anyone at school when asked about something. He stated that he was not at either party, the redacted party or the one that he attended that evening. He does, he also does not believe that he has any knowledge of a video. Okay. On 125-2024, I responded to the Chandler, Real, Chandler Regional Medical Center, and I picked up a CD containing all of Redacted's medical imaging. I then impounded the CD at the Queen Creek Police Department property room. Instagram preservations. Investigative help, 1-30-2024. 1-30-2024, I submitted preservations of the following Instagram accounts through the Facebook law enforcement online requests. And they're all redacted. The date range that the preservation was requested for was 1-1-2022 through 1-30-2024, the preservation request was assigned case number and then by Facebook. The date range that the preservation was requested for was from 1-1-2022 through 1-30-2024. The preservation reset was assigned a case number by Facebook. The date range that the preservation was requested for was 1-1-2022 through 1-30-2024. The preservation request was assigned a case number by Facebook. Okay, on 12-20-2023, I attempted to contact Sandra Flores, a redacted witness's mother. By phone and text message, Sandra only replied to my text. The following is a conversation by text between myself and Sandra. Screenshots of the text message are uploaded to the Axon evidence. Good afternoon. This is Detective Worsko with QCPD. I spoke to your daughter a couple of weeks ago about the homicide investigation we're working. I'm calling to see if you and your daughter would be willing to have your daughter walk detectives through the actual scene of the incident and have her describe everything as we go through the scene. We've had a lot of success with, with doing this with others and it has brought further clarity to the investigation. We can schedule it at your convenience. Please let me know if this is something you would be willing to do. Feel free to call me. Thank you. Sandra to Detective Worsko. Hello. I wish we could help more, but I think my daughter has done her part, and I just want her to be done with this. Detective Worskow, DeSandra, I completely understand the hesitation, and while it's your decision, this would be extremely helpful for the victim and his family. It would be very low-key and wouldn't take very long. This is important to this case, as walking through the scene while... The person describes what they had seen will create a better picture of what happened. In addition, as the investigation continues, more things are learned, and I do not have things are learned, and I do have some clarifying questions for your daughter. If you're still unwilling to do the walkthrough, is there a good time that I could talk to your daughter to clarify some of the information that she may or may not know? Sandra to Detective Worsko. I'll let you know if we change our mind. Thank you. There was no further communication ordered. Okay. On February 1st, 2021. Uh, 2021. Oh my gosh. 2024. I submitted preservations on the following Instagrams about Facebook law enforcement online requests. The date range that the preservation was requested for was from 1-1-2022 through 1-2-1-2024. The preservation request was assigned a case number by Facebook. 
Okay, now let's see. How many pages have we read? A hundred and how many? Only 132? How does I've only read 132? We've been on since roughly 11, 12, 15. Wow, how did we only read 32 pages? What's going on? I have to drink some more coffee. On 1-30, 2024, Detective D. Eribe and I conducted a scene walkthrough with a witness and his mother, Lori Meinhardt. The scene walkthrough was recorded on Detective D. Eribe's body-worn camera and uploaded to Axon Evidence. The following is a summary of what was said during the walkthrough, but it's not verbatim. Hold on a minute. I've got to get myself situated a little more comfortable. Or not so comfortable, I should say. The walkthrough started on the corner of East Via Del Oro and South 194th Street. The witness stated that he had drove with, okay, and that wasn't, uh, that was not, that was a male and his mother, so let me correct that. That he had drove with four other people. They heard about the party through Snapchat. The witness could not recall who got the invitation and only could recall that someone in his vehicle said they had an address to the party. We then walked northbound on South 194th Street where the witness pointed out the address in Queen Creek as the house where the party was being held and said they had parked near a dirt lot around the corner. When he pointed out the road east via Del Rancho and to the east 194th Street, the witness said they got to the party early, so they hung out at their vehicle for about 30 minutes, and then they went to the party and hung out for about 20 minutes. In that time, the witness did not notice any alcohol being provided, but saw kids bring in their own. He also never saw any confrontation or fights while in the party. Then he and his friends left and went back to their vehicle. When they got to their vehicle, they were still waiting on one of their friends. The witness who had not left the party yet, so they went back to the party to get him. Oh, the friend had not left the party yet. They met that friend in the driveway of the party house. Then they all started to leave and head back to the vehicle. At this time, the witness did not recall seeing any confrontation or hearing any verbal argument. As the witness got to the corner of East Via Del Rancho in South 194th Street, he started to hear a loud, excuse me, a large ground screaming and yelling. A large ground? I think they mean crowd screaming and yelling and start to form a circle in the middle of the street. At the time, the witness thought it was just kids having a good time and there did not appear to be a verbal dispute. The witness looked behind him, southbound on South 194th Street, and when he looked back in front of him, he saw a kid fall to his knees. The witness said he remembered that the person had been shoved from behind, causing him to drop to his knees. And then his body was pushed down, causing his face to slam into the ground. As the person remained face down and people started to scatter, the witness witnessed someone stomp on the back of his head, put their heel to his head approximately three or four times before running off. Wow. Wow. The witness stated the subject stomping on the person's head was a heavy set male that had darker skin, possibly Hispanic. The witness could not recall what the subject was wearing or any other descriptions of any involved, but started that, but stated that everyone was wearing dark colors. The witness also stated as 
the person was getting attacked, which we know is Preston, Lord. He heard a loud shattering noise like glass breaking. So he wasn't sure if the Preston had gotten hit with a bottle or not. The witness and his friends walked over to Redacted and started to drag Redacted out of the roadway as there was a lot of foot and vehicle traffic. When the witness initially contacted the victim, he was still conscious. The witness noticed blood, vomit, and spit coming from Preston Lord. He also noticed scratch, scratches to Preston Lord's face and knees that were like road burn. They were able to move him out of the street and moved him against a vehicle to let traffic go by. And then they moved him again onto the walkway and said that it was only people that he knew who dragged him out of the roadway and did not recall anyone else helping. While on the walkway, they attempted to wake Preston up and one of his friends reached into his pocket to find his cell phone to call his parents. Preston had gasped for air a few times before going pale. Preston had stopped breathing. There were two girls that were with him then and they had just met the girls that night. They were driving a white BMW that was parked near the walkway. The witness had a CPR mask or the girl had a CPR mask, so she gave it to someone who started giving Preston mouth to mouth while someone else did compressions. The witness believes they were performing CPR in Preston for approximately five minutes before police arrived on the scene. The witness only recalled the white BMW and the black truck parked in the area. He also said there were passerbys, but no one besides his friends, the two girls, and the other person's friend hung out in the area. The witness did not have any further information pertaining to the incident. On 1-31-2024, Detective Stat and I conducted a scene walkthrough with another witness and his mother, Peggy Shapler. The scene walkthrough was recorded on my body-worn camera and uploaded to Axon Evidence. The following is a summary of what was said during that walkthrough and not verbatim. The walkthrough started on the corner of East Via Del Oro and South 194th Street. We walked northbound on South 194th Street where the witness pointed out the address of a house in Queen Creek as the house where the party was being, help, being held. They had parked near the dirt lot in the cul-de-sac of East Via Del Rancho, just east of South 194th Street. They waited at their vehicle for about, until about 2115 hours when people started to arrive. They went and stayed at the party for approximately 20 minutes and never observed any confrontation or issues. Then the cops came by with their lights on and parked just north of the house. People started to leave, including someone and his friends. They went back to the vehicle and noticed more people were going to the party, so they went back to the party for a second time. The second time they went to the party, they did not notice any confrontation or issues. They were at the party for approximately 10 minutes the second time before leaving again. They all started walking back to the truck. The witness said he was ahead of his own group by about 15 feet. He had gone eastbound on East Via Del Rancho from South 194th Street and made it to the walkway when he heard a loud crowd at the corner of East Via Del Rancho and South 194th Street. The loudness of the crowd and the screaming caused this person to look back towards 194th Street. As he looked back, there were a lot of people running towards him. So he got behind a pillar located at the walkway of Redacted. Redacted said Redacted was walking eastbound on East Via 
Del Rancho when he was either shoved or hit, which caused him to fall. And then people started to kick him while he was laying face down into the ground. And then they ran off and friends came and checked on the person. The witness did not recall anyone but his friends helped move Preston off the roadway. They had moved Preston onto the walkway of another street and observed cuts to his face, his knees, and noticed that he had urinated. At one point, they, he turned really pale, so they performed CPR while using a mouth tube for air. When asked if anyone remained around after getting kicked, he said he noticed a taller black male standing around and he was asking if Preston was okay. The witness did not know if he was a part of the assault or not. On the night of the incident, the witness did not know who Preston was and only later identified him after the media releases and had nothing further to add, and this ended my contact. On 131-2024, Detective Stat and I, we did another scene walkthrough. Okay, same introduction there. The walkthrough, uh, this was with uh, someone and his mother, Julie Sorek. The walkthrough started on the corner of East Via Del Or, South and South and 194th Street. We walked northbound on South 194th Street where the witness pointed out the address of the house in Queen Creek as the house where the party was being held. He had arrived with one, two, three, four, five other people. However, two people did not stay at the party and had left before anything had occurred. They had parked near the dirt lot in the cul-de-sac of East Via Del Rancho, just east of South 194th Street. They got to the party before the people arrived. And so they hung out at the vehicle for 30 to 45 minutes before going inside to the party. They stayed at the party for approximately 25 to 30 minutes before deciding to leave. While at the party, he did not observe any confrontations or issues. Then as they were leaving the party, they observed a cop drive by with their lights on, so they went back to their vehicle. They hung out at their vehicle for a little bit and realized that the cops had left and more people were arriving at the party, so they went back to the party. The second time they entered the party, they still did not observe any confrontation or anything of concern, and they were there for approximately 10 to 15 minutes before deciding to leave again. They left, and as they got to their car, they were missing two of their friends, so they went back to the party to get their friends to tell them to go. They got their friends and started walking back to the vehicle for a third time. As someone approached the corner of South 194th Street and East Via Del Rancho, he saw a large group of kids run past him and head eastbound on Via Del Rancho. There was a larger black SUV parked on the corner of South 194th Street and East Via Del Rancho that blocked the view of the assault. The witness stated that once he got past the vehicle, he saw Preston on the ground and multiple kids were kicking Preston. The witness heard someone say, that's enough, and then they all started running. Preston could not provide, I mean, the witness could not provide descriptions of the kids running past him or kicking Preston and were only able to say they were in the dark, baggy clothing. He also did not recall seeing anyone run past him. After the kids scattered, the witness and his friends went to help Preston. He was in the middle of the roadway, so they pulled him to the walkway and observed marks on his elbows and a spit blood mixture coming out of his mouth. Preston was unresponsive, and the only sounds that were coming from him were deep gasps for air. When they got 
pressed into the walkway. They continued to check on him and attempt to wake him up. At one point, they recognized that Preston did not have a heartbeat. So the friends started to perform CPR. When asked if there were any other vehicles parked in the area, they said there was a small beige car parked on the south side of East Via Del Rancho, just in front of the walkway. Um, that should be an issue. Like I can... Um, See, that's the, I've already talked about the thing about the walkway, but something else. I thought I was just losing it again and talking about something else. Um, they also stated that while the kids ran past him and were kicking Preston, they were laughing. On the night of the incident, also, let's see, the witness did not know who... Redacted's friends had pulled his ID out of his pocket that night. Before ending my contact with a recent booking, studio recognized his face, but cannot recall from where Gage Garrison was posted. Okay, said that in a recent booking photograph of Gage Garrison was posted, and the witness stated that he recognized his face, but cannot recall from where. And this is Brenton Shipman writing this. On 2 7 I was tasked to follow up with tips in reference to a homicide investigation. Oh, they're also doing the Daybell trial, okay? They're doing the uh, jury selection, but the sound is horrible in the courtroom. Just saying. Just saying. On 2 7 I was tasked to follow up with the tips in reference to the homicide investigation for Preston Lord that occurred on 10 2023 The following are the results of the tips I followed up on. Tip 77 was received on 11-1 by Natalie. I called Natalie and she didn't have any further information, but she was going to speak to her two daughters and contact me later. A second call was attempted and no call back, so that tip was closed. Tip 451. This was a tip provided by Melissa Lord. It was a duplicate from tip numbers 455, 453, so it was closed. Tip 452, okay, it was originally reported by Melissa Lord, but um, it was a duplicate. Ow, so it was closed. And then another one, Melissa Lord, it was a duplicate. Another tip by uh, Jamie Herrera. I spoke to Jamie as he called the station while I was on duty. I completed a supplemental. Tip closed. Original tip provided by anonymous information was to contact Black Connolly with no specific information. Tip closed. This concludes my involvement for the above mentioned tips. Said if there's new information, the tip will be reopened and investigated accordingly, right? Okay, now let's kill go. We gotta move this. We gotta move this. This is a toxicology and an ME report received. On 2 14, 2024, at approximately 1305 hours, I received an email from Kristen Johnson with the Office of the Medical Examiner with copies of the medical examiner's report and the toxicology report. Both reports have been attached to this report, to the report. Case agent detective J. Uribe and Sergeant Jost have been notified that the reports have been received. Okay, another scene walkthrough on February 7th of 2024. And this time, with a witness and his mother, Marish Varley. The walkthrough started at the corner of East Via Del Oro, 194th Street South, stated that he had gone to the party with five other, six other people, had left the party early on. They arrived in a white GMC pickup truck that belonged to someone else and had parked in the cul-de-sac on East Via Del Rancho, east of South 194th Street. He said he was wearing a red robe type thing. 
They had gotten to the party at around 20, 45 hours and waited in the truck until they saw more people start to arrive. And then they walked to the party house, which he pointed out is the house with the address of blah, blah, blah. They remained at that party for approximately 30 minutes. During those 30 minutes, the witness did not observe or hear any confrontation or rising issues. A couple of cops and had driven down South 194th Street, and so people started to leave, including the witness and his friend group. However, after the cops had driven through and his friends went back to the party, entering the party for a second time, they were at the party for approximately 10 to 15 minutes before deciding to leave again. During this time, the witness did not observe or hear any confrontation or rising issues. Okay, the witness and his friends walked northbound on South 194th Street back towards their truck as they were walking from the party house to the corner of South 194th Street and East Via Del Rancho, the witness never observed any conflicts or physical fights. And his friends stopped on the corner of South 194th Street and East Via Del Rancho in the rocks of property. And that's redacted. They waited there as they were trying to meet up with a friend of his. As they waited on the corner. The witness observed a large crowd of people skipping along South 194th Street, oh. going northbound towards East Via Del Rancho. The witness stated that they looked like they were ready to fight. And when asked what made the witness believed that they were getting ready for a fight. The witness stated that it was a thing that kids do to get ready for a fight. And stated the witness stated that the crowd was talking, but he could only make but he could not make out what they were saying. The witness was unable to provide any descriptions of the individuals in the crowd. The crowd then passed all his friends. A witness said there were vehicles parked all along the way which obstructed his view and he did not see Preston initially get assaulted. He first saw Preston in the middle of the roadway of East Via Del Rancho. He's laying face down while approximately five subjects surrounded him and two of the five appeared to be kicking Preston. They then ran off. The witness was unable to provide descriptions of these subjects. Okay. The witness and his friends approached Preston and noticed that he was unconscious. They placed Preston in the recovery position and made sure he was not choking. There was a car, possibly a blue sedan, parked on the south side of East Via Del Rancho near something that two girls wearing black were trying to leave in. So the witness and his friends had moved Preston out of the way and into the walkway. The witness said that there was a light skinned, either Hispanic or black male with braids and somebody's friend with curly blonde hair in the area, but no one else that they noticed. Once they got Preston at, to the walkway, they noticed that he was not breathing, so they had called 911 and started to perform CPR on him until the police and the medical professionals arrived on the scene. The witness stated he noted scratches to Preston's forehead and vomit coming from his nose and that Preston had urinated on himself. Hi, little lady. The witness had nothing further to add, and this ended my contact with him and his mother. <sighs> In January of 2024, I went to Circle K, South Power Road, Queen Creek, Arizona. Reference getting the surveillance video from October 28th, 2023. Now, why would they wait? 
Why? Tell me why they would wait from October to January. Come on. I spoke to the store manager, B, who stated I could view the video in the back office. B stated she could not download the video at that time, and I would have to bring in a DVD so she could do it. I reviewed the video from about 1,700 hours on October 28th until around 200 hours on October 29th, and in the video there are numerous juveniles and young adults who are in Halloween costumes who came into the store at various times throughout the night. I did not notice anybody who resembled any of the subjects in the videos I had previously seen. The information pertaining to the video was relayed to Detective Johanna Iribi, who requested I still obtain the video in the following weeks I brought a DVD for her to download the video. B stated she would try and download it and get back in touch with me. I haven't heard from B, so I went back to the Circle K. B wasn't working that day. I was allowed into the back office to see the video. However, the recording device needed to log in information that the clerk did not have. I again went to the Circle K and B was there. She advised she hadn't downloaded the video, but we could go to the back office and view the video. We attempted to view the video, but, but, listen to this, the video was no longer on the server due to the date range being too far past the incident. Now, wouldn't they have said that? They were lucky it was there, but wouldn't they have said, you know, look, we can't let this go. When does this, does, does, your, does your machine erase this or what? That is just shoddy, shoddy stuff. Wow. That's really bad. Okay, B stated the Circle K Security Center would still have the video even though it was no longer on the server in the store. B was going to put in a request for the video through the Circle K Security Center. I gave her the date and times. I left B my email and her and contact information and the address where the DVD could be sent to give to the Circle K Security Center on 2-15-2024. I made contact with another manager at the Circle K. I was advised B was not at work, wouldn't be back until 2-20. I received an email address for Circle K Security Center and I emailed them. I contacted the Circle K Security Center via phone, spoke to a representative. They Representatives stated that the date range was too far back and they don't have the video from October 28th. The representative stated that she would only keep the video if there was an incident that happened in the store and it was time locked. It was never time locked at the time of the incident and the incident didn't happen in the store so they can't get it. Wow. The manager had previously told me that the Circle K Security Center would still be able to access the video even though they no longer have it in the store, but after speaking to Circle K Security Center, this is not the case. The Security Center has the same DVR access that the store has had since it's gone from the store. It's gone on their end. How stupid. How stupid. Oh my gosh, they had to know that they were lucky to even get it at that point, but to let it go? I also emailed someone and requested they check for the video. I got a reply stating there were no incidents time locked by the store for that period of time. The security center has the same DVR access as the store, and since it's gone from the store, it's gone on their end. There is no access to the video. On 2-14-2024, I was asked by Detective Jay Uribe to reach out to the Campo Verde High School SRO and ask if Redacted had a vehicle registered with them. And I contacted the SRO Officer Pillar and who advised that Redacted had a white Lexus with Arizona plates. And I provided this information to Detective Uribe. Okay, on 2-16-2024, D. Uribe and I were tasked with responding to the address of a redacted person to contact the Lou Jones, who may have a Tesla. We responded to the house and contacted 
Thatcher Jones, who arrived at the location as we were at the house in the Tesla with the Arizona plates. We explained our reason for contact and Thatcher state that Lou is his mother who does not drive the Tesla. The Tesla is driven either by Thatcher or his daughter. When asked if his daughter had gone to the party involving Redacted, Thatcher stated that she was not anywhere near that party and the Tesla was parked at the house. Thatcher then made a comment about how Gilbert PD had come to their house about three weeks ago to talk to Redacted about the Gilbert goons. He further stated to explain that Redacted has no content connections, excuse me, to the Gilbert goons and really stretched, stressed that he has no involvement in the incident. He stated that he would be shocked to learn if his car was in the area where the incident occurred. When asked about the specifics regarding the Tesla, as the video it records, Thatcher stated that he is still learning how it works as he just got the vehicle about three months ago. He stated that he believes it records for 10 minutes. If he does certain things, such as getting in an accident, honking the horn, or manually telling the, ve the vehicle to record it, Thatcher had no further information to provide and our contact ended there. Search warrant. 2-20-2024, 20, 20, approximately 11.44 hours, Honorable Tara Prochko with the Maricopa County Superior Court granted and signed the search warrant to obtain a full forensic extraction on Treston Billy's cell phone, a blue iPhone with a cracked screen. The warrant was served on 2-20-24 20, at approximately 12-16 hours. A copy of the search warrant affidavit and return have all been attached to the report. It should be noted that the return was completed to satisfy the law enforcement requirement of returning the search warrant within three days. A secondary return will be completed once the requested information from the forensics exam is provided. Okay. This is from Jordan Klingen Smith. On Monday, 2 26, 2024, I received an email response from T Mobile referencing Dominic Turner's call detail records. The findings from the T Mobile have been uploaded to evidence.com and a copy was sent to the FBI for further review. Nothing further at this time. Now we have Johanna Iribi. On 2 27, 2024, I conducted a review of extracted with gray key by the FBI. I noted the night prior, 10 28 23, at about 12 52 a.m., shows the device in the area of redacted. However, there are other geolocations showing a different location. So this is just showing where um, extracted with gray key. Okay. I noted the location on 1028 at 8 p.m. to be in the area of 197th Street and East Via del Arboles. I noted at 921. Three total location data in this area. I noted 926, intersection of East Via Del Palo and 194th Street. And 952, Veterans Oasis Park, 952, Sosaman Road and Acotillo Road, 953. Mansell Carter Oasis Park consistent with Snapchat data for 
redacted interviews and surveillance acquired from redacted. And then 1041 near Avenida del Val and 157th Avenue. And then Bonanza Road and Claiborne Avenue. Okay, redacted communicates with mom on 1028 2023. We're going to Goodwill. This is consistent with a portion of the group going to Goodwill for costumes per interviews conducted. Redacted communicates with mom at 1247 a.m. I know, but we just got home and there are about 20 guys out in the front. Do you want me to let them in? Mom, I don't care if they're here. I'm just asking because we're going to bed. You guys can have the house if you want. Mom sends a screenshot of social media related to something. On 1031, 2023 at 404 p.m. and they have a phone call 312. Redacted to mom. Screenshot of list of names. On 11 6 2023 at 1257 p.m. Mom, there is an undercover cop car just sitting across from Jen Odell's house. It's been there for a while. Redacted. Really? Mom. Yep. Wondering if they are looking out for Talon. I think we need to call again. Redacted. Not yet. Mom. Why not? Redacted. I want to talk to lawyer first. Mom. That's if you're guilty for something. Redacted. Redacted did it. This was the day that QCPD conducted surveillance which led to executing search warrants at Jacob Meisner. Blank and Talon Renner's residence. It should be noted after this conversation, I found multiple Snapchat conversations between two redacted individuals. It appears a kick messenger thread was created on 10 29 23 at 4 41 p.m. included, and it's a bunch of react, redacted, and then it only says writes, Did party die? If responds, nah. Why you say that? N-word fell off, T-S. Watch the vid. Unknown what the context of this conversation was. Redacted communicates with redacted on 10-30-2023 at 8.40 p.m. Yeah, glad I'm not in post involved. How does he know? Do you know him? Another person. I have no clue. It's probably on the news, and I don't know him. Again, another one. Ah, true. Well, I'm glad I'm not involved. Another. Communicates with someone else on 11 1 2023 at 7 55 a.m. Sends a photo, three photos. Writes, pretty sure Treston is already locked up. And then it says, wait, why? Like, why do you think that? Person writes, he called me yesterday and said, bro, they're trying to say I did it. I think I'm going to the station and turn myself in and tell them what happened. I don't know if he did. The next one, well, even if he wasn't the one who finished him off, doesn't mean he wasn't involved. But does that mean he's going to rat his friends out? Who knows? And sends a photo of the list of names. Got the person who posted this to take it down because now they're trying to say my name. And I air called the police and told them my side and sent that. You called the police when? You didn't tell me about that. Yesterday. What did you say? I got put on a list of people that jumped him when I didn't lay a hand nor see the fight. Maybe this is your sign to finally stop being around these kids. 
Instagram instant messages. Yo, unblock my number right now. Call via Instagram. Communicate with Tristan on 1031 2023 at 1246 p.m. Yo, call log. Tristan calls. Tristan, answer the phone. Yo, I, I'm going to tell my teacher I need to take a call. One second. Call log. Tristan calls. Yo, answer. Call log. Calls. Tristan. G. I. J. Need one photo of us. G. I deleted everything. I have like super old photos. On 10-31-2023 at 5-16, a screenshot of a Snapchat of Redacted with Possible, Redacted where they discuss the names, the list of names disseminated via Snapchat. There's photos. I noticed multiple system messages through Snapchat where specific users left the group. This could possibly be related to the social studies group chat that I learned about during interviews. I communicated with Redacted via Snap. Redacted to redacted. All right, I'm so serious. I'd get a lawyer and start building cases to start suing people. Queen Creek police are pressed ASF that people are posting this cap shite like the name, list of names. Communicates with redacted, redacted via Instagram. Nah, bro, I was pissing. I didn't even see the fight. And I saw my name on the list. I air called the cops and talked to them and sent that. Source Snapchat group. They are discussing whether Treston Billy was swatted and someone writes, Booyah. It is asked, Mason Jostin, why this person said Booyah. And Redacted replies, me and Talon won't have people blaming us for it. Referencing redacted Snapchat records. Source Snapchat group EBK. Where redacted writes, I need to borrow someone's poll for the time being. Responds, why? Writes, Q's crazy arse ex-cousins were just posted outside my crib and tried chasing us in the cars. Redacted responds, let me call someone. Redacted writes, Redacted, what's the MMP? The message threads appear to be asking for a gun due to someone being outside his residence. Conversation with Redacted and Redacted, uh, 1028. It got shut down at 1155 on 1028. Photo created 1029, 2023, 1.15 a.m. Shows subjects in the background at a residence and the following identifiable individuals. Jacob Meisner, one, two, three others, then Tristan Billy and another redacted. Four images. Multiple images of redacted and redacted between 137 and 141 and on 129. Screenshots of a text message to dad. Do you know that blank kid who got killed in the fight? Response with school. Dad, bunch of kids jumped him. Perry killed in the fight. Response, what fight? Dad, bunch of kids jumped him. Perry kids, Queen Creek kids, and other one other school beat a kid to death. Unknown time frame for actual messages, however, created 1030, 2023 at 835 p.m. Images, a screenshot of a Snapchat post, phone, a uh, photo of a phone depicting Talon Vigil and Talon Renner, screenshot of a social media post with Tristan Billy with caption, so you're 19 fighting a 16-year-old. A screenshot of social media posts with Trust in Billy's address, multiple photos of subjects involved in costumes, a subject, a screenshot of a Snapchat that shows the group Social Studies and Caroline, screenshot of something news, photo of two new iPhones in boxes from T-Mobile store, 
Multiple photos of subjects involved days after the incident hanging out together to include Trust and Billy. Photo including Trust and Billy, Mason Jostin, and unidentified person holding up hand signs. 11.1 multiple searches for redacted. Reviewing installed applications. Kick. WhatsApp, Messenger, Telegram, Facebook, Discord, Life360, TikTok, Native Messages, and FaceTime. Okay, reviewing video. Video someone watching a Snapchat post of Tristan Billy. A clip of Tristan Billy. Multiple videos of subjects involved before and after. No relevance. Videos of the assault, Snapchat with redacted showing expired media, Snapchat with someone showed expired media, Instagram communication with someone but no messages, Snapchat combo with someone redacted, Snapchat communication with Mason, Jots, Jostin, no messages or relevant information available. Okay. Oh, how many have you read? Only 154. Oh my gosh, why is it taking so long tonight? And t you know what? I think tomorrow, tomorrow's Tuesday. I think I'm going to do an afternoon session of this. An afternoon session too, because I, like, I'm falling asleep saying different words now. Okay. I received an email from Facebook records indicating that the files I had requested for the Instagram account redacted are available. I downloaded the files, uploaded them to the evidence. I advised Detective Jay Uribe and reviewed the files. The following is the information provided by Facebook. Okay. So they're talking about followers. None of the followers associated to this account are involved in the case. No responsive records located. And they show you that something that was sent 11 16 2023 yo boy finna get art in prison no other messages of importance were observed device iphone 15. there was nothing else of importance in the documents provided narrative text andrew fernandez on 10 28 2023 at approximately 21 51 hours i was dispatched with my fto officer C. Anderson to a call referenced as an assault near East Via Del Rancho, S. 194th Street. I was on a call for a service at 197th Street, E. Via De Palmas, when dispatch updated via radio that one of the victims was unconscious and one had a broken wrist. I activated my vehicle's emergency lights and sirens and proceeded to the incident. When I arrived on scene, I observed Officer Amanda performing chest compressions on an unconscious, shirtless white male, later identified as uh, Preston Lord, right? Officer Rodriguez asked me to separate witnesses and began gathering statements. Okay, summary of an interview with one of the witnesses with the body-worn camera. For exact verbiage, I contacted the person in front of an party, a house party via the Snapchat app. She stated the party was five houses down. People at the party called 911 to report the assault. Said one of her friends told her that someone got jumped and went to the front of the house to see what happened. When she arrived... She witnessed a male performing chest compressions on redacted, redacted, explained many of the people at the party were lifeguards and that they were taking turns providing aid until police arrived. She provided one of the males performing compressions with a big easy, a CPR rescue breathing mask to assist in their efforts to provide aid. She stated she did not see the assault and did not see the, anyone with or around the victim other than those rendering aid. This concludes my interview with Redacted. 
summary of interview with another witness. Okay, I contacted another witness in front of Arizona. I asked to provide with the account of what happened. Said a bunch of kids started running and told him, go this way. He saw redacted, leaned up against the wheel of a black car in front of the house. The vehicle had left by that time. Police arrived and had been parked in front of the residence located at the same house. He and four other males moved Preston out of the road and closer to the sidewalk. Each person grabbed hold of one of, the, of, one of Preston's limbs and one person held his head. One grabbed one of his arms and they moved him to the location where the first responders found him upon arrival. The witness stated that he was a student at Combs High School and he heard about the party through his friends who provided the address. He heard that it was a high school party and that his friends did not know anyone at the party. The witness was driven to the party by someone who was also transported to others, a male named and explained he was not close with blank, who was a grade older than him and played basketball at Combs High School and was in the car with him and his friends going to the party. He was unaware of any issues that the witness may have had with anyone at the school or that Preston may have had with anyone at the school and did not know who may have assaulted Preston. I asked the witness to sit with others prior to being picked up and taken home by a parent. This concludes my interview. After conducting my interview with this witness, I observed several juveniles running south on South 194th Street towards the crime scene. I contacted one of the juveniles who stated he witnessed the assault on Preston and came back to check on Preston and his friends. I asked the witness to detail what occurred. The witness explained he saw his old friend at the party. While talking to someone, an unidentified black male who knew someone approached and said he wanted to fight. The person said that that person did not want to fight and returned with a large group, excuse me, did not want to fight and the unidentified black male left. Moments later, the un unidentified black male returned with a large group and began antagonizing three people and approximately six other subjects who were with him. The witness said one of the people he was standing with began recording and one of the subjects in the large group told the person he was with to stop recording. And they began to walk towards someone's truck. The large group followed someone and his group towards the truck. Someone from the large group grabbed the person who was recording and they took his gold chain and they began hitting him. The large group began hitting and everyone they were with. The witness ran away and moments later called someone on his cell phone. The witness said that someone told him that Preston was getting stomped out. Once the witness heard news from someone that Preston was knocked out, he decided to return to the scene. The witness stated that he was on the basketball team with someone at Combs High School. The witness explained that people were assaulted and they were from Hamilton High School. The witness's friend was allegedly in a disagreement with the unidentified black male over a female who was the cause of the incident. The witness said the person had no affiliation with anyone in from the group of Hamilton High School students, nor did he have any affiliation with two other people and stated that I think it was Preston wasn't even involved and said that person was just with me. The witness explained he arrived at the party in a truck with three other people who had friends they brought with them in the truck. The witness provided me with a Snapchat handle and did not have any other form of contact for someone. I gathered contact information for 
someone and his mother at 2228 hours. Okay, I transported to the Queen Creek, but okay. Due to someone being a primary witness, Lieutenant Scott directed me to transport someone to Queens Creek Police Station for a more complete interview. Once we arrived at the station, Officer Anderson took a witness statement from the person in one of the interview rooms. I logged into the room's camera system to record the interview. For complete details about this interview, refer to Officer Anderson's supplemental report. I remained with Officer Anderson and the person until the interview was concluded and the person was released to the to his sister outside of the station. This concludes my involvement in this case, Annabelle. Okay. Um, on, this is uh, Jose Martinez. October 28th, 2149, I responded to East Via Del Rancho and South for a response Report of an assault. Call notes stated that the reporting party's friend was assaulted. The subjects involved had firearms but did not mistake, did not make threats. Dispatch advised that cardiopulmonary resuscitation was being administered to the victim. I responded to the dispatch address with my, ad with my emergency lights and siren activated in my fully marked patrol vehicle. From S197th place and East via Del Palmas, De Palmas and Queen Creek, Arizona. While en route to East via Del Rancho and South 194th Street, an officer was on scene and stated they were administering CPR to the victim. The officer radioed that the victim was unresponsive to CPR and was unconscious and not breathing. While entering the neighborhood, on East Via Del Verde from S. Sosaman Road, I observed separate groups of what appeared to be juveniles and potential party goers from the dispatched incident. The groups were approximately 10 juveniles in size and were leaving the area. Multiple vehicles were also leaving the area. The neighborhood westbound through East Via Del Verde. Once I turned southbound onto South 194th Street from East Via Del Palo, I observed approximately five fully marked patrol vehicles parked southbound on South 194th Street. I ran to the front of something. As I approached the front of the residence, I observed an officer administering CPR on a juvenile who was laying on the street Near the walkway path of the residence, the male juvenile appeared unconscious, was lying flat on his back with his hands extended out to his sides. At the front of the residence were multiple officers and numerous juveniles. I approached a potential witness who was wearing an orange jumpsuit prisoner costume. The male juvenile stated he did not see the incident, at which point I ended my contact with him. I approached another male juvenile. In order to gather information, the juvenile stated Officer Aranda had already interviewed him, at which point I ceased my interview with the juvenile. I began assisting Officer Helms, setting up a crime scene perimeter with crime scene tape. I set up tape from the southeast corner of something to southeast corner of something else. I also started taping off the west end of El Via Del Rancho from the southwest corner to the west side. Jacob Johnson. Okay, this is his report. On 1028, 2023, 2149 hours, I received a call regarding an assault. Call comments stated that a friend of the reporting party was assaulted and one person was unconscious and one had a broken wrist. CPR was reportedly in progress. It was an unconscious victim, later identified as blah, blah, blah. It was reported that there was approximately 15 suspects in the assault and all were wearing masks. Officer A. Rodriguez and OIT Aranda arrived on scene first. They advised there were several cars leaving at high rate of speed. 
They next advised that they were doing compressions on the victim with no response. I arrived on scene shortly after and observed several juveniles, officers in Queen Creek fire personnel in front of something. As I approached, I noted that the officer Grossman and officer Eschenbach contact conducted life-saving measures with the Queen um, Creek Fire Department on Preston while the walkway where the walkway to the front door meets the roadway on East Via Del Rancho. His head was facing south with his feet facing the roadway. I noticed that was that he was wearing white colored crocs which were removed by the fire personnel. I located another victim with a broken wrist, later identified as blah blah blah, fourteen year old. He was hiding behind a truck on the driver's side of the driver's door was open. He located um, located to the east of East Via Del Rancho and South 194th Street on the north side, approximately two houses east. Myself and Officer A. Rodriguez went to see what was going on with Redacted, and as we approached, it was apparent that he was injured as he was holding his right hand and scraped knee, and had scraped knees and was bleeding. Redacted was very upset and seemed very scared of what happened. Redacted was on the phone with his father, whom Officer A. Rodriguez spoke with while I got the QCFD to medically evaluate the woman. As I got to the fire department over to evaluate myself through the dirt field, um, Officer A. Rodriguez and I contacted the juvenile and I looked back towards the scene and observed that Preston was being loaded into an ambulance. I returned to the scene and followed the ambulance to the hospital as they transported to Chandler Re Regional Hospital located at 1955 West Fry Road. I remained at Chandler Regional Hospital and was able to locate information for Preston's parents, later identified as Autumn Lord, the mother, and Nicholas Lord, the father. I was later advised the family was on the way to Chandler Regional. Once Autumn arrived, I met with her in the family room and confirmed her information and provided her some information about what occurred Autumn asked if her son was alive, and I stated that he was being evaluated in the ER, but that he had a pulse. I did not provide any further information about this case or his medical condition because I was not sure of the developments in the case or the medical case. After a few hours at approximately midnight, I asked Dr. Joshua Zeidler for an update regarding Preston. He advised that his injuries were life-threatening and it did not look good. I advised Detective Sergeant Jost about the update, and he advised that Detective J. Uribe was on the way to the hospital to assist along with Officer Shipman. While waiting for their arrival, medical staff brought Preston's family into a trauma room to see Preston. Preston's father, Nicholas, did not leave his side once he was in the room. Autumn only went in the room in short bursts of time, but did not remain in the room for long periods of time. Once Detective J. Uribe arrived on scene, she asked the ER nurse to get Preston's clothes. The nurse grabbed Preston's clothing, placed it in an orange bag, and handed the bag of clothing to me. Detective J. Uribe asked me to fill out the medical records release form for Preston's medical records and ask Nicholas to sign the consent form for the release. Nicholas agreed and signed the form after looking it over. I made a copy of the form and provided it to the detective Uribe. Uribe. Shortly after, Preston was airlifted by a helicopter to Phoenix Children's Hospital. Detective J. Uribe then asked me to impound the clothes once I left the hospital. I returned to the Quake, the Queen Creek Station, where I impounded Preston's clothing, which included the following. Two white socks, 
one black hoodie jacket, one gray black shirt, one blue multicolored jersey, one pair of blue of black shorts, and one pair of multicolor underwear. While impounding the clothes, I noticed a substance on the hoodie that appeared to have a reddish brown liquid stain that appeared to look like blood. I also noted white smears that appeared to look like other bodily fluids like mucus. Once I was done impounding the clothing, I quickly I returned to the scene to further assist security until I was relieved at 5.59 hours. This concluded my involvement in this case at this time. Okay, this is Frank Grossman, and he's going to give his account on 1028. All right, so I'm not going to go over the same thing. They're dispatched to where the attack occurred, okay? After arriving at the dispatch location, I observed Officer A. Rodriguez performing chest compressions on an unresponsive male. I assisted Officer A. Rodriguez with chest compressions. Breaking a check for a male p male's pulse. Officer A. Rodriguez was relieved by Officer Eschenbau, who continued taking turns on chest compressions with me until we were relieved by by the Queens uh, Creek Fire Department personnel. I assisted further by gathering contact information for involved parties previously interviewed by Officer Hansen with. Officers Eschenbrow, during the investigation, a male refused to provide the information to Officer Eschenbau. I assisted Officer Eschenbau in detaining the uncooperative male in handcuffs, who later identified himself. I left the scene to handle other calls for service and returned to assist in the service of search warrant at the detention center. I performed a sweep for additional people in the residence and detached to garage with other officers at the scene announcing our presence and throughout the residence. We did not encounter any additional individuals in the residence and I left the scene. The supplement documents in my involvement with this case please refer to the original narrative as well as any other supplemental narratives for narrative um, gosh, I was long us to begin. For further information, we're almost to 100 pages. We've got to do 100 pages. This is ridiculous. If we did 100 pages, we'd be for how many nights? Come on. Take us 10, 11, 12 nights. Okay. On Saturday, October 28th, at approximately 2149 hours, Queen Creek police responded to a disturbance problem at E. Via del Rancho and 194th Street. Upon arrival, I observed a large amount of people, most of which appeared to be in the middle of the high school age students. There was a large amount of cars in the general area, which made it difficult to arrive on scene. I observed fire medics returning excuse me, rendering aid to a male subject, later identified as Preston Lord. At the end of the property towards the street, my attention was drawn to a large amount of juveniles on the property, and some were already talking to Queen Creek police officers. I began asking the juveniles if they spoke to police, and most were telling me yes. I contacted another who said he had spoken with police when I was interviewing him. Preston Lord was transported to Chandler Regional for trauma. The interview was conducted on the front of the property and shall serve as a summary. The witness resides in Phoenix, Arizona and heard about a party at Queen Creek, Arizona on Snapchat. Someone's friend picked him up at his residence and they went to the party at the residence and arrived at approximately 21.15 hours. The group went the party for approximately 20 minutes and then followed everyone else out as they were told to leave. While walking down the street, 
the witness observed several people running over to an individual who was lying on the street. The witness recognized some of the people that were trying to help, that they were certified high school lifeguards that went to his school. The witness didn't witness any altercations at the residence prior to leaving. The witness only had seen the victim on the ground but never saw him get attacked and did not see him when he was standing on his feet at any time. There was no fighting or arguing at the residence when the, vic the witness was there. The witness identified the following people who rode to the party and were picked up by someone, and they're all redacted. Identified his parents, who he resides with, his biological father and mother, Matt and Rebecca Goodman. Okay. After I interviewed the witness, I spoke briefly with witness and his father, Glenn Jones. I asked if I could transport someone to QCPD for an interview. Glenn said he would drive for the interview so that he could calm down as he was emotional about it. I arrived at the Queen Creek Police and Glenn had already arrived at the police department. Before I could come and make contact in the lobby, I called Glenn and he said he was on his way to Chandler Regional and was already at the police department, but nobody came, so they left. Glenn said, if I wanted to speak to someone, then I need to go to Chandler Regional with Glenn being present during the interview. I contacted Detective Sergeant Joust and advised him of the situation and asked for permission to respond to Chandler Regional, which was granted. I called Glenn back and told him I would meet him at the hospital and conduct the interview there. Upon arrival, I con contacted Glenn and the witness in the waiting room, and I was asked, and I asked for permission to speak, which Glenn agreed if he could be present. The hospital was busy, so I was not able to secure a private room for the interview. I found the cafeteria area to be empty, so I escorted Glenn and the witness to that area where the interview was conducted. The interview with the witness was conducted at Chandler Regional Hospital in the cafeteria area outside of the emergency room lobby. The witness's father, Glenn Jones, was present. The following is a summary. The witness and his friends were at a Halloween party in Santan Valley, Arizona. The address and person's party was not given. However, Taylor or Wayne Ranch was a possibility according to the witness. Witness and his friends felt the party was lame, so they went to a different Halloween party at another location somewhere in the Santan Valley, Arizona area. The, the friend... Something was sent, a screenshot of a party in Queen Creek, Arizona that was listed on Snapchat by a female friend whom they all go to school with. And all of his friends decided to attend this party not knowing anyone else who would be attending other than the witness. The witness was the driver who transported everyone to the parties. List of friends. Details about person is a quiet and shy 17-year-old senior at Combs High School in Queen Creek, a football and basketball player, and is liked by most of his peers, spends his time playing video games when he isn't in school or playing sports, and is not a confrontational person and has never been in a fight. There was no verbal altercation or any type of physical altercation involving anyone at the party prior to him leaving and being attacked. Did the, this provoke anyone at the party and was extremely quiet as none of the group knew anyone at the party? Hold on a minute. I've got to get... Hi, Taco. Yeah, I'll be right there, Taco. I've got to get something to, to wake up a little bit. Hold on a minute. I'll be right there. Don't, don't go anywhere. Because if I fall asleep, then I just start saying things. As we've heard countless times.
I'm gonna have a, an ice pop to see if it'll wake me up a little. Blake and his friends arrived at the party around 21, 15 hours and estimated they were not there more than 30 minutes. There was a large amount of people there, mostly high school kids from other schools, ages 15 to 18 plus. The witness and his friends didn't recognize anyone at the party initially. So they stood in the corner of the backyard, kept to themselves. Someone was nowhere to be found at the party, but unknown if she was there. Someone estimated approximately 100 plus kids were at this party. Someone said while they were in the corner talking that there was a shorter Hispanic male subject that appeared to be at the party by himself and wasn't with any friends. I can't go to sleep yet, Tuckle. I have to read through 100 pages. I still have 44 pages to go. Excuse me, 34 pages to go. However, um, the individual said his name, but the witness couldn't recall. However, he identified that he was 15 years old and a freshman in Hamilton High School and attended the party when he seen the flyer on Snapchat. This individual was a Hispanic male, skinny and approximately 5'9", wearing a black L.A. baseball cap, baggy cargo jogger pants or jeans, and a t-shirt of an unknown color. While in the backyard, the witness ran into an old friend from elementary school who attends high school at Hamilton High School, and they had not spoken in a while, and neither knew the other would be at the party. The other person attended a party with a group of friends who had discovered the party on Snapchat. And they talked outside for less than 10 minutes before someone was confronted by a black male individual. A male black skinny, approximately 6'1", last seen wearing a black button-up shirt, black dress style pants, slacks, and black shiny dress shoes. There were no further details. An Indian male wearing a white tank top. Someone was confronted by a black male subject, approximately 6'1", skinny dreads, wearing a black button-up shirt, an Oxford, possibly, black dress style pants, and black dress shoes that were shiny. The individual was identified, and the witness didn't hear anyone calling him by his name, nickname, or any other name, a.k.a. names. The witness had not seen this individual before and heard someone else say that he attends Hamilton High School and plays football. The individual approached the witness and began yelling and cursing at him and accused him of talking about him behind his back and spreading rumors. The witness heard the yelling, but due to the amount of people standing around and cha chanting, he was unable to hear what specifically was said and exchanged other than something about a rumor. The person told the individual he wasn't spreading rumors and the individual contained to, continued to yell and curse. The altercation was interrupted by the same Hispanic male who the person was talking to who was 15 years old and a freshman at Hamilton High School who began filming the ar argument on his cell phone. This individual was referred to as the filming guy. Filming guy description. Hispanic male, skinny. Approximately 5'9". Wearing a black L.A. baseball cap. Baggy jogger pants or jeans. And a t-shirt of an unknown color.
The individual filming the incident was approached by a group of kids who it appeared were from Hamilton High School. It was apparent this group of individuals approaching the individual filming was friends with the male black subject who was confronting someone. Several people got close to them. got closer to the individual filming and told him to delete the video, which he deleted in front of them and was showing them his cell phone. Okay. The witness and his friends saw a lot of other people starting to exit the backyard, so they followed everyone out of the backyard through the RV gate. Prior to leaving... The witness observed a male who he couldn't recall descriptors rip off a necklace off the individual who was filming the incident. The assault on Preston Lord in the street. The witness and his friends were on the street, South 194th Street, and were approaching East Via del Rancho, the same group of kids who were yelling at the individual for filming the incident between the male, black and redacted, began following someone and his friends and were trying to start a fight. A person and his friends all separated and ran in different directions. And a person ran and his behind a house and was able to see a large group of people chasing his friends and the witness watched Preston fall to the ground while he was running but he cannot see who shoved Preston or get any descriptions because of the amount of people running and it was dark Preston was on the ground and saw approximately 10 to 15 people standing over Preston And some people were throwing punches and kicks while he was on the ground. Sorry, right, hold on a minute. <laughs> the witness described one individual in the group standing over Preston while he was on the ground as a Hispanic or Indian male wearing a black ski mask and a backpack. The witness didn't see this individual assaulting but said he was standing with the group around Preston while he was on the ground. The witness didn't see the male black individual who confronted someone in the group, but assumed he was there as that group standing over Preston was the same group who stopped the filming. The witness didn't see someone or the individual who was filming the backyard altercation anywhere near the group standing over Preston. The witness said the assault and attack on Preston was less than a minute and that everybody who was standing around and over ran in a different direction, but most of the people left going down South 194th Street. Someone ran down the street towards his truck, which was parked approximately 25 to 30 feet from where Preston was laying in the middle of the road on East Via Del Rancho. Someone's truck was parked on East Via Del Rancho, and he could still see Preston lying in the street, but was afraid to approach him in fear of being attacked. Several high school individuals from Phoenix ran towards 
pressed in and began dragging him out of the road and onto the property of something. The witness ran over to the individuals helping and they began CPR and said they were certified lifeguards and further advised that he wasn't breathing, but he had a pulse. 911 was called and the witness stayed by Preston until police and fire medics arrived. The witness said at no time did he hear Preston talk, could only hear him breathing. Preston was completely unresponsive and was barely breathing. While the witness was waiting on police and fire, he was told someone had a broken wrist stemming from being pushed down by the same group. Some observations of someone waiting for the fire rescue. Someone was wearing Oklahoma City Thunder jersey with a white t-shirt under, wearing only one white croc, missing the other, and wearing black athletic shorts. That's Preston. Preston was wearing Oklahoma City Thunder jersey with a white t-shirt under, wearing only one white croc, missing the other, and wearing black athletic shorts. Preston's chin appeared to be cut open and was bleeding heavily down his throat and neck. Cuts and scrapes were observed on both of Preston's hands and knees. the lower part of his legs. The witness didn't observe any other injuries or bleeding coming from anywhere else on Preston's body or face area. I was given provided information about a possible suspect wearing an electrician style costume and I asked the witness if he had seen anyone wearing that type of costume and he said no. The witness recalled seeing two white male individuals wearing inmate jumpsuits, black and white, near the group of people who were standing over Preston while he was on the ground. I asked the witness if he ever recalled seeing glass in the street. And he said yes, and recalled seeing a vehicle leaving at a high rate of speed, running a glass bottle over and breaking it. Interview terminated. The interview with the witness was also conducted in the cafeteria area at Chandler Regional Hospital. Adam Grahan sat on, on the interview as a family friend adult of family. Following the summary of the interview and should not be misinterpreted, as verbatim, best, um, verbatim unless quoted. A witness was at his residence, picked up earlier in the evening at an unknown time by his friend. The witness identified the following people as being present in the vehicle and at the party as, and they're all redacted. Events prior to the party at. The witness was picked up earlier in the evening at an unknown time from his from his residence, the group of friends listed above went to two different Halloween parties in Sandhan Valley. The group was informed of a party in Queen Creek by someone else whom the witness could not recall. Everyone decided to go to the party in Queen Creek as it wasn't a far drive from where everyone lived. The group arrived at the residence after 2,100 hours and stayed less than one hour and everyone noticed that there was a large amount of high school aged juveniles at this residence. The witness said he didn't know anyone who was at the residence, so he hung back with his friends in the backyard of the residence. Shortly after arriving, The witness recognized two other juveniles who he knew. 
Someone and someone and someone talked to both in the backyard for approximately 10 minutes and then a verbal altercation between two individuals started. A verbal altercation in the backyard started between two individuals. One individual was a male, black, tall, wearing a black beanie, unknown any other clothing, confronted another dark-skinned male, possibly black or Hispanic, short, wearing a white tank top, top shirt. The tall black individual was smoking and blew smoke in the other individual's face and was yelling at him for starting rumors. The verbal altercation lasted for less than two minutes and was interrupted by another Hispanic male individual who began recording the altercation with his cellular phone. This individual was a shorter Hispanic male, unknown clothing description, first name believed to start with an H. A group of people confronted the individual and told him to delete the video, which he did and then his necklace was ripped off of him. The individual who ripped the chain off was a stocky and shorter Hispanic male wearing a white suit with white pants and dark colored pinstripes on the suit and a red t-shirt under the white suit. The witness and his friends began to leave the backyard after the verbal altercation. The group of people who made the individual filming the incident delete the video was now following that person and his friends and trying to get them to fight. The group continued to follow them out into the street as they approached another street, E. Via del Rancho. The witness said that he and his group of friends began running as the other group was trying to fight with them. The witness continued running on South 194th Street. And while he was running, he watched a tall, white, male juvenile with blonde hair wearing a t-shirt punch someone's face while someone was running and trying to get away from the group that he was being chased by. The person didn't, the witness did not see how many times this individual punched the person and didn't see anyone else assault the person, but verified he saw the white male individual punch this person one time in the face. And this person didn't see any other details involving this person being attacked, but heard from other people that he had a crowd of people attacking him while he was on the ground. This is Preston Lord now being attacked. While the witness was running after he witnessed Preston Lord being punched, he witnessed a tall, skinny male, white juvenile, wearing a plaid button-up shirt, push Preston to the ground while he was also running from the group chasing them. The witness didn't see anything further regarding anything more involved male confronted in the backyard a male black hispanic wearing a white tank top shirt individual confronting another male a tall male black wearing a black beanie unknown other clothing description filming individual a shorter hispanic male unknown clothing description name possibly starts with an h suspect who punched tall male blonde hair wearing t-shirt unknown color no further clothing description suspect who shoved tall skinny male wearing a plaid button-up shirt suspect who took the chain off the individual filming incident a shorter stocky hispanic male wearing a white suit with white pants dark pinstripes on the suit and pants and red shirt underneath the suit a witness estimated there were over 100 kids at this party and approximately 20 plus people chasing him and his group of friends. The witness ran down the street, called his brother who came to pick him up, and then later brought him back to the scene to talk to the police. The witness saw broken glass in the street and heard a car run a glass bottle over that was leaving. The witness didn't see anyone dressed like an electrician, but did see several people dressed like construction workers in jail inmate costumes at the party. 
I spoke with Detective Sergeant Jost, Sergeant Muth, and Detectives Aribi, Driscoll, individually and briefed them of information relayed to me from the interviews. I responded back to the scene and met with Lieutenant Southwick, Detective Sergeant Jost. I was then tasked with conducting an interview with the parents at the residence. Interview with Roberto Carrera. Roberto is the homeowner at that residence. I made contact with him at the front door of his residence and I was invited into the residence. The interview with Roberto was conducted inside his residence in his kitchen living room area. The following is a summary of the interview. Okay. Roberto Carrera, husband, Emily Carrera, wife, and the daughter, another daughter, Michaela Carrero, another daughter, another friends. Okay. Well, I guess the daughter had a get together with her friend planned for the night of 1028 Saturday. The daughter had a friend get together every few months and the family knows all her friends who come over. The only friends who were supposed to come over were blah, 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 blah and two other females who Roberta couldn't recall. Snapchat flyer. Roberta was unaware of any flyer about his... Re Roberto was unaware of any flyer about his residence in social media. Roberto did not give consent for a flyer to be distributed to social media and knows his daughter was not responsible for that. His daughter is allowed to have friends over, but they have never allowed her to make announcements on social media, nor would the daughter think to. I asked Roberto about the free alcohol portion listed on the flyer and I explained to him there were allegations of Roberto and Emily providing alcohol to the daughter and her friends at the party and Roberto denied all those allegations and said that he has never allowed his children or friends to drink alcohol at his residence. Roberto has never provided alcohol to anyone at his residence under the age of 21 and has never allowed anyone to bring alcohol to his residence. The daughter and his, and his other two daughters have never have had many sleepovers and friends come over for get-togethers and there has never been alcohol on his premises provided or bought to his residence by anyone. Roberto and Emily only consume wine which is usually just on the weekends. Roberto and Emily were inside their residence in the living room watching television and drinking a glass of wine. Both were aware of the kids being in the backyard. However, Roberto only thought it was the daughter's friends. The noise out back continued to escalate, not in a disturbing way, but Roberto realized there were more than a few people in the backyard. Roberto heard a female yell, stop, and when he got off the couch, he saw several people walking fast towards something in the backyard. Roberto went into the backyard and was overwhelmed and surprised when he observed a large amount of kids that he did not realize were there. Roberto started yelling, get the F out now. Roberto said he yelled so many different times and everyone slowly started leaving the backyard through the RV gate. Roberto denied seeing anyone consuming alcohol and didn't witness any alcohol anywhere in his backyard. But then he said he wasn't really looking when he went outside. He was only trying to get everyone to leave his property. Roberto didn't hear or see anyone fighting at any time and didn't see anyone filming with their phones. Roberto observed several female juveniles taking selfies of themselves, but nothing else. I asked Roberto again if when he was inside the residence, if he heard any type of commotion, anything like people arguing, exchanging words, or yelling of any sort. Roberto said the only time he heard yelling was a girl yelling, stop. The noise he heard was everyone talking and being loud, but not in a fighting or aggressive manner. Roberto didn't witness any type of disturbance or altercation 
of any kind on his property or after everyone left. Roberto was unaware of the kids that were attacked in the street after they left his residence and only heard that from the Queen Creek police officers earlier. Interview terminated. Evidence collected. Not applicable. Photographs taken. And a body-worn camera. This concludes my involvement for the time being. This case will be turned over to Criminal Investigation Unit. I will be available to assist CIU with this investigation at any time. They were in costume. Yeah, as jail inmates. Isn't that uh, ironic, right? Okay, this is uh, Johanna Eribe. Attachment. Signed medical releases. Signed medical releases. Persons contacted. Nicholas Lord, the father of Preston. Melissa Triconte. And mother Diana Villobos. Dr. Joshua Zeidler. Chandler Regional Doctor Adam Graham. Media provided. I provided a screenshot of the Snapchat flyer. Reference the party. I took photographs of redacted with my department issued cell phone and uploaded them into Axon Evidence. Supplement 1 10 29 20 23 12 18 hours. I was contacted by investigation Sergeant M. Jost requesting that I respond. Reference this case. Sergeant Jost provided the incident in involved a juvenile male who had been injured during a Halloween party in the area and was in critical condition. <sighs> Investigation day, 1028 to 1029. Initial observations. Upon arrival at the scene, there was a large amount of police vehicles, patrol vehicles, and subject vehicles, and subjects within and outside the crime scene perimeter. On getting out of my vehicle, a female identified as Diana Villalobos approached me asking for assistance in locating her son. I learned her son, redacted, was a witness to the incident and had not been formally interviewed. I explained the situation and someone would contact her when she was able to pick up her son. I also informed her that she was able to stand by while we interviewed her son and she stated she would wait nearby. I ended my contact with her. I waited for Sergeant Just and Detective Lyons, Lyons to arrive on scene so the primary officer could provide the incident debrief. I conducted an initial scene walkthrough of the above listed location. Officer A. Rodriguez provided the debrief as follows the primary incident location was identified as the roadway near redacted. A secondary incident was identified as a residence. The following is a summary and not verbatim. A party was hosted at a residence. Sometime during the party, a verbal argument had ensued. The homeowners of the residence kicked everyone out. The verbal argument had ensued. Uh, hold on a minute. The verbal argument was between groups which occurred in the backyard of the residence. During the verbal argument, a subject had begun recording the argument. At some point, it turned physical out in the roadway. First victim identified as Preston Lord, 16 years of age, was found unconscious. Some other subjects who attended the party began to provide life-saving measures until law enforcement and emergency medical personnel arrived on scene. Initial information was provided, which that the victim had been struck in the head, fell to the ground, and went unresponsive. Subjects on the scene began to provide CPR. Once law enforcement arrived, officers provided five rounds of chest compressions. No pulse was acquired and agonal breathing was reported. Emergency medical personnel took over care to Preston and were able to acquire a pulse. 
Preston was transported to Chandler Regional Medical Center where he was at the present time on a ventilator and still unresponsive. Officer Jay Johnson and Officer Shipman responded to the hospital. Initial visible injury descriptions for Preston. Abrasion to the right side and blood to the right side. Initially located on his back per witness interviews. Abrasions to both knees. A second victim identified as was reported to have been shoved east of that victim during the physical fight and sustained a possible broken wrist. Initial visible injuries to that person, visible injury to the right wrist, hand dangling and unable to move, abrasion and bleeding to the right to the left knee. I learned officers had some witnesses at the Queen Creek Police Station awaiting interviews. Further information provided was a male subject later identified as redacted had taken a video of the entire verbal argument that occurred within the backyard. Information was the video depicted a male involved in an initial verbal argument and he was described as wearing a white suit with red accents. Snapchat username for this individual was provided. Seen walk through only the primary location in front of something just at the front of the property near the paver was a walkway with medical supplies and debris. There were white crocs lying nearby. There was only a small amount of burgundy red sub substance stain on the ground consistent with blood. <laughs> consistent with blood. I covered the stain with a folded paper to mark it temporarily until crime scene specialists arrived. In the front yard of the residence, officers had multiple subjects sitting down and waiting to be interviewed. Approximately 15 to 20 feet from where Preston was treated, there was a silver passenger car parked on the south side of the road, approximately one to two car lanes east of that vehicle. It was a dark passenger car also on the south side of the road, approximately two residents from where Preston was treated on the north side of the road was a dark colored truck with the bed open as well as the front door driver door between 194th Street and the dark colored truck in the middle of the roadway was evidence of broken bottles and initial scene walkthrough. Okay, this interview is a paraphrase summary. Physical description, light medium skin male and dark hair undercut style about to his ears. The costume was an all-black robe like the Scream ghost character and had a white ghost face mask. Said he found out about the party via Snapchat post. He was dropped off by his mother and was alone. He said he was going to meet friends. He had arrived at about 2100 hours and was only on scene for a short period of time prior to the fight. He said he never made it into the party. He said his mother could not get out because there was a group of kids in the way. He said he asked the group nicely if they could move. And the group said, are you trying to start problems? He said everything started happening around the same time. And then the same group of more than six people were chasing a kid. They said the kid was running around the stop sign yelling, help, and described him to be wearing a blue jersey. He said the kid got hit and kicked repeatedly while he was on the ground. He said that he did not see any weapons. He also reported multiple subjects and the dark truck. He stated he didn't want to walk over until he knew there was already a subject. Wait, he stated he didn't walk over until there was already a subject in an orange jumpsuit be, being CPR said that someone tried to get the kid on the ground to wallet for identification. He did not know the subject getting hit. He said the last time he saw that he saw the subject running north and to the left. He 
He provided the following descriptions for the subjects involved. A wizard costume with a gold cape and purple on the outside, described as a white male. A male with a wife beater, black pants, and air forces. He described the subjects were a mixture of white, Mexican, and African-American. He stated that he thought a large Mexican threw the first punch that he saw. He said the subject was wearing a white tank top, a brown midnight blue color, and electrician outfit. He further explained a blue jumpsuit with the sleeves cut off. I concluded my interview with him and escorted him to a patrol officer's near the north perimeter to coordinate getting him united with his mother. I left the scene to Chandler Regional Medical Center with while Detective Lyons and Detective Driscoll remain on scene. I met with Officer Jay Johnson, who was on scene with someone. I met with Preston's father, Nicholas Lord, and his stepmother, Melissa Chaconte. I introduced myself and I informed them that I was the lead investigator for this case. I gave a brief explanation of the possible investigative steps. I asked, I also asked if they could complete a medical release authorization form which Nicholas signed. The original was provided to the nursing staff and a copy is attached to the report. While on scene, I took initial photographs of any visible injuries to Preston, which were uploaded to accident evidence. I learned emergency medical staff had thrown away Preston's clothing in a trash in the trauma room. He was presently being treated, and I asked Officer Jay Johnson to recover the clothing and place them into QCPD evidence. I met with the physician, Joshua Zedler, who stated that Preston had a brain bleed, no apparent skull fracture, and abrasions. He said he was stable but in critical condition. Preston was being transferred to Phoenix Children's Hospital by air. I learned some of Preston's friends, who were possibly witnesses, were on scene in the waiting room with some of their parents. I met with Officer Shipman, who was in the process of interviewing someone who was with his father, Glenn Jones. This is a summary of what Officer Shipman provided, not verbatim. Okay, that... Um, <clears throat> someone's friend group approached a subject identified as redacted who goes to Hamilton High School and greets him. The encounter occurred near the pool area in the backyard of the residence. A subject described as a black male, 6'1", with dreads and button-down dress shirt and is believed to be a senior at Hamilton High confronts someone. It should be noted later in the investigation, the male described above is identified through a witness interview of someone as someone. A short time after the verbal confrontation occurred, someone returned with a group. The verbal confrontation continued, and at one point, a male Hispanic, about 15 years of age, begins to record the verbal confrontation should be noted the Hispanic male who was recording the verbal confrontation was identified by various interviews as redacted. The group shifts their attention. The shifts their attention to, to that person and tells him to delete the video at some point that person's friend group, which included Preston and someone else, leave the residence. As they are walking, the group follows them. At some point, a subject yanks someone's chain. A large group of about 10 to 15 kids chased, and they ran and watched from the corner house. They saw the group throwing punches and kicks to Preston while Preston was on the ground. According to the witness, he no longer had seen something and was able to provide a description. One subject, a Hispanic Indian male in a black ski mask and backpack. 
With the group standing over Preston, I ended my debrief with Officer Shipman and went on to assist with interviewing the juveniles at the hospital. Interview with Adam Graham, father to somebody and somebody. I met with Adam Graham, who's a parent to someone's and someone's group. He provided the information he had gathered from his son. I asked to speak to his son. The following is a paraphrased summary of what he told. Son and his friends went to a party. When they arrived at the party, they said hi to a friend. A subject approached a person and was mad about someone talking trash. He was described as a black male wearing a white tank top with a black tie over it. He described the male that approached as a male, black male in a black dress shirt with a beanie dress shoes. He said... He possibly goes by redacted because he heard someone say his name. It should be noted through interviews that he was identified as redacted. And he keeps trying to say he wants to fight, but he doesn't want to and leaves the party. And said a circle had formed around him and as they talked trash to each other. At some point... They leave the circle. At this point, one is recording and a subject that is believed to be with the group tells that person to delete the recording. They delete the recording and his group, to which includes, leaves through the gate. A group of about 20 plus subjects follow them out. At some point, someone's chain is pulled off and knocked his hat off and said he got hit, causing him to stumble, but didn't know who hit him. Said people started putting up their fists to fight, and they ran off. And someone ran off to the side of someone's yard, jumped the fence. He said someone was running in the middle of the road, running and got left behind, got hit and fell to the ground, and he didn't see the rest. He said he was sent a photograph of a subject and said he was the one that hit the photograph was a still shot of what he believed to be an Instagram profile for Talon Vigil. The witness showed me a second photograph depicting a subject in a white pinstripe suit, a red tie, a red handkerchief, or rose, and was medium complexion. And he said the subject was the one that pulled the chain and threw the first punch. It should be noted through the investigation and interviews that the subject was later identified to be Treston Billy. Okay, and then someone stated a female named, someone was the one that provided the screenshots described in the latter. I confirmed with someone that they arrived at the party in someone's truck, and I wasn't sure if they had their cell phone during the incident or how it ended up inside the truck. I provided my contact information and ended my contact. <sighs> interview with someone accompanied by Glenn Jones. This kid went to the party with his friend group, which included someone and upon arrival of the party, they said hi to a friend named something. They went while they were talking to someone, another male described to match that of someone started talking crap to someone else describing Description of the male who went up to the person was a black male, six one, all black, black button up, black dress shoes, black dreads. Someone left for a few minutes, returned with twenty to thirty friends. Someone had left by this time and had recorded the incident, and they were told to delete the video. They said the tension was rising. They got their friends together and they left. They got followed, and his friends. As they walked to the truck, the group followed them and began picking on them. One subject took his chain and his hat and said he didn't see who it was because he was trying to get to safety. He believes that he jumped and didn't see that. However, he did recall seeing the subject hit in the back of the head and described the subject as wearing a hat, a purple sweater, and gray sweats said that about six or seven subjects ran after him and he ran off. 
And he said when he came back to the scene, officers were already on the scene. They had received the same photograph shown by someone. He identified one of the photographs shown by him as Talon Vigil. However, he made the mistake and did not identify Talon Vigil. He clarified he had seen a subject in a white tux with a red on his chest. He described as his own attire as follows. Black shorts, yellow, and Nike dunks. Devin Booker's jersey later took it off and had a black and white beater. I concluded my interview. I arrived at PCH Phoenix Children's Hospital and hospital staff were in the process of conducting scans on Preston. I met with Preston's mother, Autumn Lord. I introduced myself and spoke to her briefly, updating her on what could be provided reference the investigation. I also met with PCH MD Molitor, who provided me a brief update on Preston. I was informed that Preston was still completely unresponsive and the CT scan showed a lot of swelling to the brain. They were attempting to keep Preston's vitals stable. I stood by while the neurosurgeon spoke to the family, gathered the following. There were signs of a stroke. He explained that Preston had lost blood flow to the brain due to the swelling and there was a possibility the medication given to him early on had assisted with the swelling and returned blood flow. However, the damage to the brain had already been sustained. He stated the neurological exam is showing no activity. He explained medications and machines were keeping his heart pumping. Information was also provided that a scan had showed some abnormalities in the blood vessels of the brain. It was unknown if there was a something that might have triggered that might have been triggered by the jarring from the assault. I was informed the likelihood of Preston's survival was not probable. I had a medical release form completed and provided to staff copy of the form is attached electronically. I ended my contact with the doctor and I continued to Preston's room. I spoke further to the family on scene and provided updates I could provide. End of day. At the end of day, about 600 hours. Christopher Anderson, on 1028 at approximately 2149, I was dispatched with my officers in training to a report of an assault. Upon our arrival, I observed over 20 cars leaving the neighborhood with young high school aged occupants. Other QCPD officers had already arrived and I observed a white male on the ground on the street in front of 19403 East Via Del Rancho. The white male was unconscious, and Officer Rodriguez and another officer were kneeling over the male performing CPR. Other officers were already interviewing witnesses in front of their home. I observed my trainee, Officer A. Hernandez, interview special witnesses. For a full account of these interviews, refer to the supplemental report. His. At approximately two to two eight hours, we transported the witness to the Queen Creek Public Safety Building for a voluntary interview. Upon our arrival, I was tasked by Detective Sergeant Jost to interview. The person called his mother, Andrea DeBoss, on a video call, and I verified with her that I could interview her son with her on the line. person was wearing a green Celtics basketball jersey. The person was initially very distraught during our contact with him and was crying when he was on the phone with his mother telling her what had happened. I set up an interview room inside the public safety building and Officer A. Hernandez, Fernandez logged into and activated the room's camera for the interview. 
The person confirmed his name and contact information, said he was a senior at Combs High School in Santan Valley. He said he was with nine other people he went to school with. Um, he said that he was on the Combs High School basketball team with several of his friends, including someone. He said that he and the nine others were in something blue truck driving into Queen Creek when they decided to go to the party that had been advertised on Snapchat. The invitation had been shared with them by someone and the person hosting the party was named something. The party was advertised as bring your own alcohol, weed, and to respect the house. The group decided to go and see if the party was worth it and only plan on spending a short time there before going to the Queen Creek marketplace. They arrived at 2100 hours. The person described the party as unlike any party he has ever been to, said he did not recognize the majority of the people there. He said there was loud music and the majority of the people at the party were drinking and smoking weed and cigarettes. He said the group he came with did not partake in any drinking or smoking and spent most of their time being wall huggers. He heard from another party goers that the police had apparently responded earlier in the evening to the altercations that they had not shut down the party. He said there were still people in the garage playing beer pong and people in the backyard. He walked in the while in the walkway leading to the backyard from the garage area. The witness said he saw an old friend from his childhood. And he was known to him as a football player at Hamilton High School and a resident of Santan Valley and greeted him on friendly terms and then they started talking. Someone turned around and a black male blew a marijuana vape pen into someone's face. The dark-skinned black male was described as having dreads hairstyle, black dress shirt, black socks, and a gold chain. Someone quoted the black male saying to the person, I'm not going to sneak you because I have respect for you, but you're going to have to dance with me. Someone indicated he was not going to fight and later mentioned to the person that he was believed he was going to be jumped since he had heard that the black male had been looking for him all day. Someone reported observing an unknown Mexican kid start to record the scene on his cell phone as a large group of unknown people started surrounding them. Led by the unknown black male, a bigger Asian kid started yelling at the Mexican kid, recording and telling him to stop. A bigger Asian kid started yelling, record, recording and telling him to stop and recording and delete the footage. Someone described himself trying to de-escalate the situation by also telling the Mexican to stop recording and delete the video, which he apparently did. During this time, the person said that someone slipped away while the focus of the crowd was on the Mexican kid. Someone said that people started taunting and following his group, including those four people said that he and his group were individuals. He felt grabbing on the back of the jersey he was wearing and saw an unknown male White male strikes someone in the back of the head, causing someone to fall to the ground. Someone described the white males wearing a black suit, red tie, blue jeans, and white Air Force shoes. Someone said he saw something going down to the ground, but he did not see any further assault because he was in the process of defending himself while fleeing from the crowd and said he ran with someone and started hopping fences before joining up with several streets away. He called for a ride and someone who was at a separate party who eventually brought someone back to the scene where he contacted the OCPD police officers who reported that somebody was injured and had broken a wrist. Someone described some of the hostile crowd. He described one as an Arabic 
wearing a furry ski mask. Others were wearing suits and mostly were tall and strange look, strong looking. Leading someone to believe they were on a football team together said that he heard the unknown black male commenting to someone about leaving the football team, which further made someone believe that they were all on the Hamilton high school football team together at one time. I provided someone a business card with my email address on it and confirmed he was getting a ride home from a family member. I walked him out to the front of the building where he was picked up by his sister. I observed Officer Fernandez later call back to obtain a clothing description for someone and they described the clothing as black or white, white beater suit, shirt, possibly a red tie, possibly blue jeans, and possibly a black hat. I conveyed pertinent details of this interview to Detective Sergeant Joust and Detective Johanna, Johanna Uribe. This concludes my involvement in this case. This is Adam Helms. Okay, same thing, right? I was dispatched. Call notes indicated there was one juvenile unconscious and unresponsive, and there was another juvenile who had a potential broken wrist. While en route, Officer Rodriguez and Officer Aranda advised that they were doing compressions on a juvenile who was not responsible, responsive. Upon arrival, I observed approximately 50 cars leaving the area and juveniles running away from the area wearing costumes. As I exited my patrol vehicle, I ran towards E. Via Del Rancho and observed a juvenile who was later identified as uh, Preston Lord lying on the ground in front of something, was unconscious, did not appear to be breathing, his arms were open to the side, his legs were stretched out, his eyes were closed, Officer Rodriguez was doing compressions on him. I then observed a large group of juveniles standing around, Officer Coda asking me to begin interviews, uh, interviewing the juveniles. I first made contact with someone who was visibly upset and crying, and she stated that she left the house party she was attending. The address for the house was blah, 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 stated that she was walking down the street and she was approaching E via Del Rancho. She saw the victim lying on the ground and she did not see the fight. I then spoke with someone else, stated he did not see the fight, but saw the lot person lying on the ground as he came down, E via Del Rancho. I then spoke with someone else who stated he was leaving the party, and as he approached E via Del Rancho, he saw three black males, unknown clothing, and five white males, unknown clothing, circling. When I asked the person, if they had any other description, he stated that he could only tell me that there were three black males and five white males. He stated he saw the person fall and all the kids began hitting him while he was on the ground. After I interviewed the juveniles, I began setting up crime scene tape and advised Officer Vasquez to begin a crime scene log. I taped off the neighborhood at Evia del Oro. I was then relieved and left the scene. This is by Erica Vasquez. On October 28th, at approximately 2149, I responded to um, that area in regards to an assault while I was en route to the call. Dispatch notes indicated the responding Reporting party was calling Queen Creek Police to report his friend was assaulted and needing medical attention. Dispatch notes indicated that they were advised to dispatch that there were two victims. One of the victims had a broken wrist while the other one was unconscious. Dispatch advised 2153 hours CPR was in progress for the unconscious victim while I was still en route to the call. Dispatch noted in the call that there were immediately approximately 15 suspects who were wearing masks. Fire was en route to the dispatch location as someone was continuing CPR on the victim. Arrival on scene. Upon arrival on scene, I was provided a crime scene log and advised to begin recording names of any person leaving or entering the crime scene. 
See the crime scene log for further details. Upon documenting the names of the witnesses, I was advised to stand by with six juveniles who were inside the crime scene. All juveniles were interviewed by other officers prior to me making contact with them. I made contact with the juveniles by the names of blah, 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 blah. I asked them if they knew one another and they stated the following. Some advised that he drove his vehicle to the party with so and so and so and so and so and so. The male subject stated they were from Awatoki, Arizona and go to the Desert Vista High School. Others stated that she drove her vehicle and arrived at the party with so and so. The females advised they both go to Hiley High School in Gilbert, Arizona. The males and the females made it known that they did not know one another and met outside the party and never made it to the party because they saw everyone running away from the house. While I was standing by for detectives to talk to juveniles, um, someone asked if she could grab her big easy that was on the ground in front of the residence. I asked someone where it was and what a big easy is and she stated it was a CPR mask. I ex uh, she explained she grabbed it from her vehicle when the victim later identified as Preston Lord was laying on the ground and provided the CPR mask to the males who were performing CPR on the unconscious male subject. I advised that she would not be able to grab any evidence and her Big Easy would have to remain at the scene. I advised he observed advised he was observed someone was in the middle of the roadway advised he did not move but observed another unknown juvenile moving him to the side of the roadway um, stated he observed he had a blue tint to his face he called police immediately he started checking for a pulse but he didn't feel a pulse he began using the CPR mask provided by Vivian to conduct CPR he advised To, he advised he continued CPR until the Queen Creek police arrived on scene and took over. He mentioned that they are both lifeguards. All six juveniles stated they did not go inside the party because when they arrived on scene, there were juveniles running from the residence where the party was located. All six witnesses stated the incident was something quickly happened and they were unable to get their photos or videos um, of the suspects fighting. They all stated there was approximately 20 juveniles outside. The six were advised to stay for further interviewing without talking to one another. When they stood for detectives for further interviewing, I was providing their apparent information by each juvenile. I contacted the parents with my department issued cell phone and notified the juveniles parents why their child was being interviewed by detectives. Each parent stated they understood and were appreciative of the phone calls. I stood by while each witness was interviewed individually by the detectives after detectives were completed with their interview process. The juveniles had their photos taken. with a department issued cell phone for evidence. After completion of the photos, all six witnesses were escorted outside the crime area. So-and-so were picked up from the scene by their mother, Alejandra Carvalho. The mother was notified she was being picked up by the mother. The four male witnesses were picked up by somebody's mother, Julie Sorek. 
and parents were notified that they were being picked up by Julie. After the juveniles were picked up, I was assigned with assisting the detectives with a warrant for the residence. I was tasked with standing by outside the residence with the homeowners who hosted the party located at blah, 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 while additional officers conducted a protective sweep of the residence. At approximately 3.15, the homeowners were provided a search warrant for the residence. Prior to conducting the sweep, while I stood by with the homeowners outside the residence, additional officers conducted a protective sweep. After a protective sweep was completed, crime scene specialist Thurman and Detective Lines entered the residence through the backyard. I was relieved by Sergeant Muth, who took control of the crime scene log. This concluded my involvement in this case. Hi, DB. Did we make it to 100 yet? Oh my gosh, we have eight more. Okay, this is another one. Jose Garcia, I responded with my fully marked Queen Creek Patrol Tahoe with emergency lights and sirens activities due to the victim having life-saving efforts being done to them. It is noted that my Axon body-worn camera was activated. Upon arrival, I saw numerous cars leaving the area. Upon arrival, involved parties began to flag myself and others responding officers to the victim's location. The victim, who was later identified as Preston Lord, was in the front door walkway closer to the roadway and appeared to be non-responsive as bystanders were doing life-saving measures Prior to police arrival, Officer Rodriguez began doing life-saving measures on Preston. I began to separate the crowd from the immediate area and told them to back away from this scene where the victim was having life-saving measures being done on him. As more officers arrived, I was able to conduct interviews with the following subjects. I spoke to witnesses, bystanders, who stated the following. They stated that he and his friend heard of a party taking place. Their vehicle, which was parked at E. Via Del Rancho and South 194th Street, they looked back and saw someone walking eastbound on E. Via Del Rancho, and they saw approximately 30 subjects push someone on the ground and start to kick him. Once Preston asked what was going no, once somebody asked what was going on, all the subjects dispersed northbound on South 194th Street. Someone and someone dragged Preston out of the roadway after he was assaulted, while bystanders then began life saving measures. In addition, they stated that. Preston was not moving and turned pale. I also conducted an interview with someone who stated the following about the incident. That they were walking eastbound on East Via Del Rancho with Braden back to their vehicle when someone and someone looked back and they saw someone get Preston get pushed and start getting kicked on the ground by a group of subjects. While the subjects, did, when the subjects dispersed, someone and someone were able to get Preston out of the roadway. When other bystanders began life-saving efforts on Preston, neither were able to provide any identifiable features for the suspects. They did mention that he had heard about a party via social media. As I conducted scenes, the security arrived at the scene and stated he had witnessed the incident. They said he was in the backyard of the house regarding a party that was taking place there while in the backyard. His friend said hello to an unknown subject, and then that unknown subject pressed his friend. When asked to explain what pressed means, he explained that it's a method to intimidate another person and act like they're going to fight. The unknown subject then came back with 25 subjects. Someone had never seen the subject before but described him as a black male, 6'1", dreadlock hair, said another suspect. Um, 
Name something. Had video of the incident. The S involved suspect made him delete the footage after it was filmed and he was unable to provide any information for someone only that he attends Queens Creek High School and is possibly a freshman and has no further information. Uh, you know what? I honestly hope that these officers know that that video that, that he said he was deleted is completely recoverable in that phone. It's completely recoverable, and I hope that they recovered that video. <sighs> Upon completing my interviews, I looked for surveillance footage at the following. Both addresses didn't have any video. Hi, Mr. Electric. Hi, Taco. Hi, everybody. Uh, both addresses did not have any video of the incident. In addition, a black shoe and an unknown black fabric were located at the address. Police supervisors were advised of the items located. Okay, this is Antonio Rodriguez. He was dispatched officer in training. Aranda and I were riding as a two officer training unit responding to an unrelated call for service in the area of Chandler Heights and Hawes wrote, while we diverted from the call and responded to the assault call, we responded to code three per policy and continued emergency driving until we arrived on scene. As we arrived on scene, we were flagged down by multiple teenagers yelling that he was not breathing and that others were conducting CPR. Officer Aranda and I ran to the area in front of something and observed Preston laying on the ground on his back. He appeared blue in color, was not responsive, had blood on his face. An area on his right cheek where he appeared to have been hit and a scrape on his knee. Other teenagers were conducting CPR and I had them stop and take over compressions. I instructed Officer Aranda to begin separating witnesses and work on identifying them. Shortly after I began compressions, Officer Grossman arrived on scene and assisted me with compressions. Once Queen Creek fire took over, I observed a male later identified as someone standing by a GMC Sierra pickup truck and he was on the phone holding his wrist and crying. Officer Aranda and I made contact with him, who stated he hurt his wrist when he was shoved and believed he had been punched in the head. Officer Aranda began speaking to him, and I grabbed his cell phone and made contact with his father. His father stated that his son told him very little information and only confirmed that he was at a party where a fight broke out and that he was shoved and believed to have broken his wrist. I confirmed with his dad if he was responding to the scene and he said yes, he would be picking up his son. His father stated he would transport him to the hospital for care and decline transport via ambulance. As I talked to his father, another call was coming through on the phone, which said ID. I asked who was that. He stated it was his friend who he was at the party with. I answered the phone and made contact with the person who stated he was around the corner hiding after running away from the fight and would return to our location. We looked west through the empty dirt lot and observed a male walking through the lot. He was later identified as someone there who stated that he saw the entire thing and he told Officer Aranda that he observed when, he got, when Preston got punched and said he was punched from behind and fell down. He described the person who assaulted Preston as wearing a black mask with no other description. Okay, um, please reference Officer Rhonda's supplemental report for further information. And after speaking with so-and-so, Officer Rhonda and I worked to secure the scene, and I instructed Officer Rhonda to put up police tape. Once the scene was secure, we were advised by Queen Creek Fire Battalion Chief that prior to transporting to Chandler Regional Hospital, they were able to get a pulse. Once fire was escorted from the scene, Officer Aranda and I prepared the detective briefing. The briefing summary was completed in the briefing to Detective Uribe, Uribe. Detective Lines and Sergeant Joyce was given by Officer Aranda and I. 
I stayed on scene with Officer Aranda while he was assigned to different tasks by detectives and Sergeant Jost. While on scene, I received a phone call from Officer Johnson, who was at Chandler Regional when the victims and his parents, and he advised me that the victims' parents were observed Um, let me see. The victim and his parents, and he advised me the victim's parents were tracking his cell phone to the black GMC Sierra. Officer Aranda and I checked the keys and observed a black cell phone on the center console, a wallet, and a keychain with keys attached. Officer Aranda and I left the vehicle the way it was and advised detectives of the new information. Officer Aranda and I stayed on scene until... We were released by Sergeant Muth. This is the end of my involvement with this incident. The residents, I contacted Officer Rodriguez and advised I would take over CPR, at which time we switched. And I began to perform CPR. I performed multiple rounds of CPR on the victim until the Queen Creek fire took over and continued to give medical aid. During this time, assisting units spoke to multiple witnesses to the incident, which had advised there was a large house party located at something, and that is where both parties were involved in the fight had come from. Myself and assisting units attempted to contact the homeowners at the front door but had negative contact. Officer Hansen advised he was able to contact the homeowners on the north side of the residence through a side door and advised them of the incident. See Officer Hansen's report for further details. Myself and Officer Hansen conducted a security check on the residence with the verbal consent of the homeowner who had walked us through his residence to ensure the scene was safe. It should be noted that one male who had exited the residence at, as officers were contacting the homeowner were detained due to failure to identify. The male, Nicholas Galinci, later identified himself and was released with no charges and given a verbal warning. No additional police activity was taken. Action was taken. See the report for further details. Okay, this is Evan Storch. On 10-28-23, I responded in reference to an assault. A juvenile male victim was reported to be unconscious and another had a broken wrist. Officers arriving on scene reported that they located the unconscious male juvenile on scene and they were not assigned tasks to assist with witness interviews. and canvas of the scene. Officers continue life-saving measures with the victim until relieved by personnel from QCFD. I remained on the scene and assisted with managing resources at the scene until approximately 23, 30 hours. At this time, I left the scene to assist with handling and supervising other calls for service within the town. That concludes my involvement in this investigation. Okay, we're done, I think. We did it. We managed to do another 100 pages. Oh, my gosh. I don't know what's what. What's, I'm just so tired, and I don't know why I have this, like, chest pain. Oh. I don't know. Maybe it's just a lot of stress. Sounds like that's not my job mentality. Anyway, I think we're just going to do word cookies and then going to go to bed. I don't even know what tomorrow's Tuesday. Okay. All right. Let me um Let me do this. Kelly puzzle here.
Yeah, I don't know, Taco. It's um, I don't know. I've got a lot of tests coming up this. Got some coming up this week. We've got some more coming up in the next couple of weeks. I'm quite concerned about them, and I think maybe anxiety or something. I don't know. I don't know, but. Also, my stomach didn't feel that great tonight, so I don't know if it's something with that. I, I don't know. I just when I'm sitting here, I just have this pain right in the middle of my chest. Right in the middle. Maybe muscle strain, yeah, I've been running around doing a lot of stuff too. Could very well be, could very well be. Hi, Murder of Crows. How are you? What do you have? You have J U D D E R S. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Isn't the yeah? I'm just gonna rest. I I have to go to the. I have to have so many tests coming up, and I've just had my like a lot of stuff um, done, and I have other stuff coming up. It's just uh, there's a, there's a lot of stress with it. Just, just a lot of anxiety with everything that I have, and there's a lot of anxiety on um, just. Uh, other things, you know, other people going through stuff and just hopefully it's just stress because I've been having something else and so I'm just I'm just gonna go to bed. I'm just gonna go relax after this and that's it. I had a heart attack. Did you, DB? You had a heart attack? Oh no. When did that happen? When did that happen, DB?
What do you do? I prefer mystery blobs to mystery pains. I can't tell you. Um, mystery blobs? What are mystery blobs? I don't know what that is. Utters. Oh, yeah, that's right. Utter and utters, right? Utter. And others. Oh my gosh. I missed off. Uh, let me just get these two words here. Um, D. Oh, how about No I tried, dude, it doesn't work. Duds. Duds. Right? And so I was thinking of suds, but can't do that. Thanks, DB. Appreciate that. I did duds. I did S U E R, didn't I? S U E. I thought I did, yeah. S U E. I am. I'm going to get some rest. I just want to finish this one word. I just want to finish this. Okay, what do you think it is, huh? Oh, 
user. I thought I did user. I did user right here. Let me. Okay, I'm going to have to go. I'll have to finish this tomorrow. I just don't, I don't feel good. Okay, so I'm going to go. But thank you for watching, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. God willing, pray I will. Um, prayers for all that need them. I'll see you tomorrow. I just, I don't feel good. Something's hurting me really bad. All right. Um... So be good. I'll talk to you. I see where I can end this. I have to go to the other thing to end this. Here we are. Okay. What? Third? All right. We'll see if it works. Okay. Okay. Alright, good night everybody. Love you guys. Love us.